What's up everyone, welcome back to another What If video. One of the most interesting suggestions for a What If that I've seen so far were people asking me to make one about Goten being born first instead of Gohan, or the two being born together, or if Goten was born earlier, or whatever, things like that. A lot of you wanted to see Goten be brought into the story much earlier than he was, so I think I have a good way to do this. While it not changed too much at first, I think this What If will make for a pretty interesting scenario in this part and even more so as it ends up continuing. In this video, we'll be looking at what might have happened if Gohan and Goten were born as twins. However, we're not going to make them look the exact same. Instead, we're just going to say that the two hybrid Saiyans are fraternal twins, which, if I got my terminology right, means that they're twins, but they're not identical. It's actually more common than you'd think when it comes to twins being born. Not all pairs of twins are actually going to look identical. This is mainly to distinguish the two in terms of physical appearance, so you won't just be seeing two Gohans running around on screen or whatever. After the events of Dragon Ball, Goku and Chi Chi end up settling down, and instead of having one kid, Chi Chi instead gives birth to twins, which they name Gohan and Goten. And for those of you that may ask, Gohan is born first, so he's technically the older brother, even if it's only by a few minutes, but that doesn't really matter. I just wanted to say that in case someone was wondering. The two are raised pretty similarly, with Chi Chi's main focus being to make them smart. This ends up changing Goten a little bit, since he's raised a little differently than how he was raised in the original. But also, Gohan ends up growing up in a different environment, since he basically has a best friend now that he's really close to, that being Goten. The two of them are raised the same in terms of education, but Gohan is actually a little different since he's not a shy kid anymore. Now he has someone his age that he spends most of his time with, so he's kind of reserved and introverted like he originally is, but not nearly as much as normal. Goten is kind of like how he is normally, being more extroverted and fun-seeking. The two complement each other pretty well in this regard, they're like two sides of the same coin. Chi-Chi, having to take care of the two kids now, wants them to both grow up to be scholars, so she takes their education very seriously, but the two obviously enjoy playing together and such, so they occasionally would have free time and sometimes end up being with Goku, who would end up showing them basic martial arts. They're not going to be expert fighters, obviously, I mean, they're only kids, but Goku wants to start them out early since they could definitely have the potential to be really strong, and this gives them something productive to do in their free time that will ultimately be good for them in the future. They're only four before the reunion at Kame House, so it's not like they're going to do any intense training, but they've actually begun sparring lightly together now that they're old enough to have more coordinated movements and such. They're not insanely strong, and they only have a power level of about 10 each, which is weak, but that's already greater than the average human probably would have, which is interesting for Goku to see, and it's way greater than someone like Gohan had in the original story. Another interesting point is that they both have tails, which isn't important for Gohan, but that's obviously a huge change for Goten since he wasn't actually born with one in the original story. As normal, a reunion is planned at Kame House, which Goku ends up going to with his two sons. Much to everyone's surprise, Goku not only shows up with one kid, but two, both of whom were the same age and with one of them actually looking exactly like Goku. It was odd for them to see Goku with one kid before, but seeing him with two kids now surprises them even more. A bit farther away, a ship lands on a farmer's property, with Raditz emerging from it, who then proceeds to fly towards the first high power level he senses, that being Piccolo. They have pretty much the same interaction, with Raditz realizing that he picked up on the wrong power level, and then he eventually ends up detecting another power level and going off to find it to see if it's Kakarot, which of course that is him. Back at Kame House, the group is having a nice time seeing each other again since it's been a while since they've reunited, until an unexpected visitor arrives and interrupts the festivities, Raditz. Not only is he shocked to see his brother alive and being a good-hearted person, but he has two children now. Not only have you become soft, Kakarot, but you've been getting busy! At least that means you've helped expand the Saiyan race! Goku has no idea what Raditz is talking about, and Raditz realizes this, so he then ends up filling Goku in on his history and such. Raditz begins to threaten Goku to do what he wants, asking him to either join them or kill 100 people by tomorrow, or have the planet be destroyed. And for an incentive for Goku to come and find him, he ends up kidnapping Goten. While Goku regains his strength, Piccolo comes over like normal after seeing what happened, and the two of them team up to get Raditz with Gohan actually wanting to join because he's angered by Raditz doing this to his father and then kidnapping his brother. While the group sees this as not being safe for him, Goku decides to take him anyway since Goku's pretty naive like that, and it would be a good experience for Gohan since he obviously wants to go, and it will give him some nice insight of what fighting is really like. For extra power, 
Krillin actually decides to join in as well so they can have strength in numbers. And they know Raditz is way stronger than them, so Krillin wants to help this time just to make sure Gohan is safe since Goku and Piccolo will be busy with Raditz and Gohan will probably need someone watching him just in case. And if they end up actually needing Krillin, he'll step up to the plate and help them. The four of them end up heading over to where Raditz is, finding Goten trapped inside of Raditz's pod, who's obviously pretty happy to see everyone come there to save him. Goku, Piccolo, and Raditz begin fighting as normal, with Gohan, Goten, and Krillin watching on. While Raditz is distracted by the fight, Krillin and Gohan take the opportunity and they rush to the pod to free Goten, but Raditz notices this and then he fires a blast at the group of them. Goku reacts quick and jumps in front of the blast to protect the group, which badly injures him. His arm took the brunt of that blast, so now it's badly hurt and broken, but he's still able to fight, even though he's nowhere close to Raditz's power level. And with this distraction of Raditz being focused on the group and Goku, Piccolo actually takes the opportunity to go away and charge a special beam cannon as Goku tries to get up after taking that blast. The only bright side to this is that Goku actually gets a rage boost from seeing Raditz try to kill his friend and his two sons, so he ends up fighting Raditz with just one arm, and while it's a nice display of his persistence, it doesn't really do much other than distracting Raditz from what Piccolo is doing. Raditz ends up getting bored, and he punches Goku in the gut, sending him flying, before he walks over to him on the ground and prepares to kill him. But out of nowhere, Raditz feels two objects collide with his chest, and looks down to see Gohan and Goten. The two are angered by Raditz's actions, and they both had temporary boosts in power, kinda like Gohan did in the original, and this actually allows the two of them to charge towards Raditz and injure him, and since it's two of them this time, they do a lot more damage. He's knocked far back, and he actually falls to the ground, and angrily picks himself up and charges a double Sunday aimed at Goku, Krillin, and the two unconscious kids. He's really angry now and wants to take everyone out. But in that moment, he realizes that the group is one person short, one green person. The Namekian is gone, and before he could even fire the blast, a beam of light pierces through his chest, putting him out of commission. Piccolo has successfully charged the special beam cannon from far away and hit him with it, and he ended up killing Raditz easily. Raditz was way too distracted to notice this, and at the last moment when he realized that Piccolo was gone, it was already too late for him. Raditz is defeated, and Goku ends up living this time, with Raditz telling them that the other Saiyans would arrive in a year's time to end up finishing the job and get Kakarot to come with them, or kill him and destroy the planet. Goku looks at his dying brother in pity as he begins to get back up, and he watches Raditz slowly bleed out and finally end up dying. While they're now faced with the threat of the Saiyans coming in the future, they're at least happy that all of the group survived and no one actually got injured and Earth also isn't destroyed by Raditz right now. The group ends up heading back to Kame House as they let Goku rest, eventually retrieving a Senzu bean from him to fully heal. Piccolo is present with the group and tells everyone what's going on, and how the Saiyans will arrive in a year's time to end up killing Goku and destroying the planet. I debated whether or not they would still try to come, since they don't know about the Dragon Balls right now, but I feel that hearing Goku's group defeated Raditz would be enough for Vegeta and Nappa to want to kill Goku as revenge, since they know he's still alive. And they could potentially come for his two hybrid sons. Goku, along with Gohan and Goten, return to Chi Chi, where she's filled in on what happened. And although she's reluctant at first to let them train, once she hears that Raditz tried to hurt her kids, she's more than happy to let the kids train since she doesn't want these Saiyans hurting them again. If anything, she's fired up now because she wants revenge against them, and it would be great if her sons were able to do that and protect themselves. The one year training begins. After seeing their latent power against Raditz, Goku and Piccolo both want to train the kids to make them stronger. Piccolo is frustrated with Goku's training methods and tries to instill a lot of his own methods within the kids, and the two end up working together to train the kids now to prepare against the Saiyans. While Piccolo is pretty harsh, the kids have Goku around now to make the training a lot smoother and not feel as harsh. While Piccolo doesn't like how soft Goku is, he deals with it since they need to cooperate to fight the Saiyans. As part of the training, Piccolo ends up convincing Goku to leave the two kids in the wilderness to fend for themselves, while Goku and Piccolo go on by themselves to train since they're at a similar power. While it's a scary adjustment at first for Gohan and Goten, they end up getting used to it a lot quicker, and since they're at least together with each other, they're not too scared about being left alone in the wild. They end up getting the hang of it a lot easier than Gohan did, and adjust to living alone in only a couple of days. The two spend a lot of time sparring as well, with the little techniques that they've learned from Goku and Piccolo so far. Eventually, Goku and Piccolo see their progress and how they've adjusted, and now that the kids are independent and can fend for themselves, they take the kids back for more training after about a few months time. 
Goku and Piccolo would either train together or with the two kids, or sometimes switch off. And this allows the kids to have the lighter, more martial arts oriented training from Goku, as well as the harsher, power increasing training from Piccolo. They end up learning a lot of different techniques as well. They can sense and suppress power, use Ki Blast, and do things such as the Masenko, Kamehameha, Solar Flare, and other techniques from both Goku and Piccolo. On other occasions, Goku and Piccolo go train by themselves, as Gohan and Goten do the same, now that they're powered up, and they learn to fight together with great synergy and try to come up with some combo moves too. After a few more months of training, the group see it as a good idea to meet up with Krillin, Yamcha, Tien, and Chaozu to try and train with them as well, all of whom have spent most of their time training on the lookout. Kami welcomes the group on the lookout with somewhat weird interaction with Piccolo, but the two showing a mutual respect. He could sense that Piccolo's kind of changed since he last saw him, and now he's a lot more... friendly, as friendly as a demon can be. They still don't know about the Namekians yet and that they're part of that group. Now that they have more people together, the training becomes a lot more effective as the humans can train with Gohan and Goten now and get stronger with Goku and Piccolo. With that, I think it's a good spot to leave off for now. We left off with Raditz being defeated by a combined effort of Goku and Piccolo, with some help from Gohan and Goten, and a little bit more help from Krillin as well. After Raditz's defeat, the group and the other humans begin preparing with some hardcore training, especially focused on bringing out the inner power of the Saiyan twins. The two grow a lot closer, alongside growing closer with Piccolo and training with Goku too, who have taught them a lot and trained them to be much more powerful and fearless. The group then went to the lookout to train with the other humans for the remaining time. And since it's early DBZ, why not start off the video with some power levels? The group as a whole is much stronger than they were originally, except Goku is a little bit weaker, but not by a considerable amount. Remember, he's alive and never trained the King Kai. No gravity training, spirit bomb, or Kaioken for him. Chaozu is around a power level of 800, which isn't much, but it's stronger than the original, and it shows how effective the training was. Krillin was much more motivated to help this time around after witnessing the fight with Raditz, and realized he needed to get ahead. This newfound motivation spread to the other humans that he was around. Yamcha is at 2100, Krillin is at 2500, and Tien is at a huge 3200. Yajirobe, surprisingly, he even trained more as a result of this, and actually has motivation to fight this time, and his level is about 1500. Gohan and Goten were able to train effectively with Goku and Piccolo by switching off with them, as well as their experience in the wild. The two of them are around the same in terms of power, and have also created a lot of combo moves and unique fighting styles. Given how Goten is when he's part of Gotenks, and how Gohan acts as the Great Saiyan, it makes sense that the two are very eccentric and eager to make these new kinds of combo moves. The two of them have unlocked their inner power and are more motivated to fight together, making an unstoppable duo of two fighters at power levels of 3900 each. Goku and Piccolo have mostly trained with each other, and Piccolo saw the most benefit from this, now being at a level of 4500. Goku was originally at a level of over 8000, as well as having Kyle Ken. However, he's weaker this time around, only at 6000 at maximum. He's still strong, but without Kyle Ken or his higher power level from King Kai's training, he's definitely disadvantaged. But it balances out, as the rest of the group's increase makes up for Goku's loss in power, and their collective strength is huge. Time passes and the Saiyans do end up arriving, with the same group as normal showing up, except Goku, Goten, and surprisingly Yajirobe at present this time around, so they have three extra fighters. Knowing about key control and suppressing their power, they all do so, and they seem weak to Nappa, with the highest power level being Goku at a mere 1000. Not even stronger than Raditz, how pathetic. Nappa lets the Cybermen out like usual, with the group working in unison to defeat them. They make it seem like a challenge, but really, the Cybermen are nothing. Nappa is surprised, but not scared. He's above everyone else in terms of power, so goes right for it. Tien and Yamcha decide to band together to fight Nappa, who's starting to get bored because he doesn't see this as any kind of challenge. Nappa begins by charging at them, and he feels he has an advantage, while the two humans work in sync to fend him off. They stop bluffing and they power up now that Nappa isn't paying attention to his scouter, and since his guard is down because of it. Tien and Yamcha coordinate their attacks, and while Nappa has his guard down, Yamcha uses his wolfing fist, destroying his scouter and knocking him flat. Nappa's a little dazed and caught off guard, but he gets up only to see Tien, who lets out a solar flare, as Yamcha prepares a spirit ball to attack the blinded Nappa. The heavily weakened Nappa picks himself up and prepares to launch an attack at Yamcha, but then looks above him to see that Tien has changed positions, and he lets out a powerful tri-beam, all while Yamcha's spirit ball is assaulting Nappa from all sides. 
While individually, Yamcha could stand no chance and Tien could only hold off Nappa a little bit, together, their combined attacks actually end up killing Nappa, showing the fruits of everyone's training and the new power of the humans. While they are a little winded, they were successful, with Gohan and Goten being sad that they weren't the ones that got to fight Nappa. They really wanted to test out those combo moves. Vegeta understandably is shocked, as well as furious. How could these weaklings kill Nappa? He didn't notice their power spike, and their power levels right now are only a few points above what they were before. In this moment of the distraction, Goku gets behind him and grabs Vegeta's tail as everyone charges to attack. Vegeta chuckles at the attempt to disable him with such a dumb trick, as he elbows Goku away and lets out an explosion of power that knocks everyone back. He destroys his scouter thinking that it's broken, as he launches an assault. He's outnumbered, but he doesn't realize he's overpowered as well. Tien launches another solar flare, as everyone rushes him and fights in sync while blinded. Vegeta's vision slowly comes back, and he begins to fight back and pushes the group away. He jumps up into the air and launches a Gallic gun towards Gohan and Goten, who attempt to push it back. Goku then joins them to push it back further, and Vegeta is then attacked from behind by Piccolo, who grabs him by extending his arms. This causes Vegeta to be swallowed by the Kamehameha, and then Piccolo slams him onto the ground, putting him all the way in the dirt, which angers Vegeta even more as he launches a beam through Piccolo's chest as revenge. Piccolo, not dead, falls to the ground, and this causes Gohan and Goten to go into a rage as their power soars and they fight Vegeta with the rest of the group joining to push back. The twins rush Vegeta together, perfectly in sync with their punches and kicks, and while Vegeta is basically ragdolled at this point from not guarding against their powered up punches, they end up launching a coordinated attack. Gohan uppercuts Vegeta into the sky, and Goten jumps high above and spikes him back down, with the two repeating this faster and faster as if it's some game of volleyball. You could see I'm drawing some inspiration from Gotenks here. Just as Vegeta is about to escape this, the two launch Kamehamehas towards him, crushing him in between, with Goku and Yamcha joining in with their own Kamehamehas to further crush Vegeta, making it so Gohan and Yamcha on the ground have a little beam struggle with Goku and Goten who are in the air, in order to keep Vegeta in place, hoping to defeat him with this. The rest of the group joins in, with Chaozu even helping by trying to paralyze Vegeta, which doesn't work too well because of the power difference, but it's no big deal as Tien then jumps in to launch a tri-beam to blast Vegeta out of the struggle and finish it off. As Vegeta is launched away, Krillin takes this opportunity to use his own Destructo Disc, which nearly hits Vegeta, except he dodges it in the nick of time as he's flying out of the beams with his own explosion of power. Gohan and Goten's combo move while they were enraged, actually ended up becoming a full-on coordination between the entire team, except for Yajirobe, who wasn't that adept with Key Blasts. And of course, Piccolo on the sidelines, who's pretty much out of commission for now. Vegeta is obviously in a bad spot. He's losing pretty badly, and he throws up his power ball in the air in a last-ditch attempt to try to turn the tide of the battle. He begins laughing to himself as he looks up at the power ball in anticipation. He'll become a great ape and he'll crush them all. This is definitely gonna work. And he stands there, waiting. Nothing's happening. Vegeta didn't notice, but when Krillin threw a Destructo Disc at him, it actually did hit Vegeta and slice his tail off. With all the pain in every area of his body while being crushed by the two Kamehamehas and launched out by Tien's Tri-Beam, he never actually noticed this. His whole body was in pain the whole time, but he didn't actually know his tail was sliced off until just checking now. But the Power Ball doesn't just do nothing. Remember from the last part, Goten has a tail in this what if and by extension can become a great ape, and obviously, Gohan still has one too, just like he did originally. So while Vegeta doesn't become a great ape, two other people do, Gohan and Goten. Just like Piccolo and Goku have seen before in their training, the two begin to grow, under the influence of the Power Ball that's in the sky. They try to destroy the Power Ball, but it's not like the moon where they could just blow it up. They might be in trouble here. But, because of what Vegeta said, everyone realizes that only Saiyans with tails will be able to do this. Goku first tells Krillin and Yajirobe that they need to help Piccolo if one of them has a Senzu Bean, because if he dies, then there will be no Dragon Balls. After that, both Yajirobe and Krillin, who have a Katana and Destructo Disc respectively, now have to go face the two Great Apes and cut off their tails. Gohan and Goten have fully transformed and are rampaging and coming towards the group. You fools! Vegeta says weakly. After Piccolo is healed, the group ends up distracting the two Great Apes so Krillin and Yajirobe can sneak up behind them. All while Vegeta curses to himself for his failure, and flies off now that his plan has failed. With the group being distracted by the two kids, he used this opportunity to leave them. They obviously do notice Vegeta leaving, and they do want to go get him, but there's no time. 
they need to stop these two kids because they're more dangerous than Vegeta at this point. Vegeta's heavily weakened and already basically defeated, but because of the 10 times boost you get when becoming a great ape, one of these individually is multiple times stronger than Vegeta, so of course they're going to focus their attention on them. The two great apes, blinded by rage, begin to fight each other. They're completely out of their minds right now, as one would expect. Krillin and Yajirobe are in position, but above them, something catches their attention. They see Vegeta's pod as he's trying to escape, flying off in the distance. This also catches the attention of the great apes, with Gohan and Goten both launching beams towards the ship, blowing it up and sending Vegeta falling to the ground. Krillin and Yajirobe cut off the tails of the twin Saiyans and they return to normal, unconscious, but fine, and the group is actually victorious. Although they still sense Vegeta's powers present, despite his ship being destroyed. Chaotu and Yajirobe bring the two kids back to the lookout, and the rest of the group goes to find Vegeta. They find the prince laying on the ground, nearly dead, and admitting his defeat. He has no option to escape now, he's out of energy and badly injured, and he just awaits his death, with everyone eager to finish him off. But Goku steps in to stop them, kinda like he did originally with Krillin, saying that they shouldn't stoop to his level and kill him. For now, they can leave Vegeta alive. And the group does think Goku's crazy for this, but he has his reasons. We left off last time with the group confronting the defeated Vegeta, who really has no options left in terms of what to do. While the group did want to kill him, Goku obviously protested and wanted to let him live because he's Goku, that's something he would do. He definitely has lost, considering how the group is still standing, only a little bit injured, and they're far better off than they were in the original. Gohan and Goten probably suffered the most damage, turning into great apes and then fighting each other, then becoming unconscious when having their tails cut off, but that's pretty much the worst of it. Everyone else is basically alright. And other than Nappa, no one died. Goku wasn't even crushed by Vegeta, so he's fine too albeit a little tired out. The prince fades into unconsciousness as the group takes him away somewhere to deal with him. He wakes up back at Capsule Corp, bandaged up and healing thanks to Bulma. Since he's awake now and Bulma's really the only one there, they actually have their first interaction way earlier, which is basically just them fighting like normal. He's really angry, he wants to know who she is, where he is, and why he's all bandaged up. And then he remembers that he lost. Yeah, he doesn't really take that well. Bulma just tells him to shut up and calm down, and she contacts Goku and his friends so they can actually talk to him and get some info out of him like they wanted to. It's the whole reason they brought Vegeta back here and healed him. The group arrives, and then they begin to talk to Vegeta. Before he says anything, Vegeta has a question for the group about the Dragon Balls. Now this comes as a surprise to the group. They don't know how Vegeta even knows that the Dragon Balls exist. But if you remember in the last part, I briefly mentioned when Piccolo was shot by Vegeta, Vegeta remembered hearing someone mention the Dragon Balls vanishing if the Namekian died, and he wants to know if they were referring to the same ones he knew from the rumors, those wish orbs that can grant you anything you wanted. Since they can't really lie about it as he already knows basically, they confirm it, which makes Vegeta happy to hear. In case you haven't realized it already, this means the Namek arc isn't going to exist as we know it. Vegeta is only just now finding out about the Dragon Balls, and during his fight, his scouter was broken anyways, so it's not like Frieza would hear about it. The fact that Frieza hasn't heard about them yet, or at least the fact that they're real, would mean that he's not going to be heading to Namek right now. No one on Earth is dead either, except for Nappa of course, and the Dragon Balls are still on Earth either way, so they don't really need to go to Namek either. Anyways, Vegeta's desire now is to find the Dragon Balls to get his wish of immortality. The group obviously wants to know what his wish is, and since he knows that he can't go under the radar about trying to find the Dragon Balls, and the fact that he can't really do anything right now anyways and they'll probably find out sooner or later, Vegeta just decides that he might as well be honest and tell them what he wants. He tells the group that he wants to wish for immortality in order to fight Frieza so he could defeat him and revenge the Saiyan race. That's the true reason why he sent Raditz to Earth to find Kakarot. The group obviously doesn't know who Frieza is or what his ambitions are, and Vegeta tells them all about Frieza. He and his father basically ruled over the Saiyans, until their planet was blown up by a meteor, which also destroyed their race. He's been working for Frieza ever since, but he's wanted to revolt against him and finally get his revenge. He hates working under him, and he doesn't want to take any orders from him. He was the same person who enslaved the Saiyan race, even though Vegeta, the prince, should be the one with the power over them. Hearing this gets the group to realize, while Vegeta might be a bad guy and is very misguided right now, his goal is actually somewhat justified. Learning about Frieza gets the group to realize not only how powerful he is, but how cruel he is as well. Since they're keeping Vegeta around and may as well not have him as an enemy, Goku chimes in and tells Vegeta that he wants to help. 
The group is pretty shocked to hear that Goku wants to help Vegeta of all people. And Vegeta not only denies taking help, but he tells him that it's pointless because they're not going to be able to defeat Frieza unless he somehow gets immortality. They're obviously not going to let him get that, but they can help Vegeta with something else, training to get stronger. Gohan and Goten actually join in and say that they'll help too, since they agree with their dad and they want to help defeat this Frieza guy, no matter how strong he really is. For all they know, he could set his sights on Earth next, and they want to prevent that. The rest of the group eventually obliges, since it's better for them to not be enemies with Vegeta either way. The only issue now is that the group is out of Senzu beans for a bit, so Vegeta will have to heal normally. While the rest of the group is around, they ask Vegeta about what he did for training to become as strong as he is, since it could not only help him, but it could help the group collectively. He begins by mentioning that the reason that they're so much weaker is because Earth's gravity is weaker, while his home planet had higher gravity, and that might account for it. Krillin picks up on this and wonders if Dr. Briefs and Bulma might have a solution, so he goes to ask them about it. Some time passes and the group actually plans what they want to do now. Vegeta's still obviously a bad guy, so they can't trust him 100%, but this Frieza guy sounds a lot worse, so they might as well make a loose alliance with him and start training, because training would not only help them against Frieza, but against Vegeta if he potentially goes against them again. Bulma and Dr. Briefs actually were able to make the gravity training room, in only a few days, and people could start training in it now. The advantage of it is that you can go beyond 10 times gravity, meaning it'll be more effective than what Vegeta did, and they can also go lower than 10 times gravity so they can ease into it. They won't just be able to handle 10 times gravity right away. So the group begins to head in and it allows them to train a lot more effectively. Vegeta's still recovering, but after a few weeks, Korin eventually has some more Senzu beans, and Goku takes one for Vegeta which lets the prince heal up. From healing, he gets a Zenkai larger than he originally did between the Saiyan Saga and Namek because his injuries are a lot more severe this time around. He originally went from 18,000 to 24,000, but this time around he gains a little bit bigger boost and is close to 28,000 in power now. He was close to dying in the original story, but he was way closer to that this time. So that's why the boost is larger, but not too much larger. The best part about healing means that he can actually begin training now. First, he does want to go by himself, he doesn't really want to train with any of these fools. This obviously doesn't really work out since people need to use the gravity room as well. So eventually, after some time, he does start training with Kakarot a little bit, just because he's the strongest and he might be able to help him defeat Frieza since he's a Saiyan as well. While he's disgusted by the idea of training with a low-class warrior, at least it's better than training with these humans. This Kakarot is the only Saiyan around now, so he doesn't really have any other choice. Goku eventually convinces Vegeta to let Gohan and Goten train with them, and while Vegeta doesn't care much for training with the humans, he does remember that these two sons are part Saiyan as well, so they might have higher potential than even himself. Vegeta's still obviously a bad guy at this point like I said before, but his temporary alliance with Goku and friends is kinda like what he had on Namek with Gohan and Krillin. They want to help defeat Frieza, and they did give him some effective ways to train, so he obviously won't say no to that. Besides. Kakarot is the only other pure Saiyan alive at the moment, at least the only one that they know of because Broly's a thing and they obviously don't know who he is right now, but that just means he's better off sticking with a fellow Saiyan and keeping their race alive rather than killing Goku and fighting Frieza on his own. About a year passes and some interesting changes happen. First of all, this means we've passed the time where the Namek arc originally occurred, which originally happened in December of Age 762. We are now in November of Age 763. And alongside the timeline, there are some other changes we're going to cover. First of all, Bulma's already pregnant with Trunks, much earlier than she was originally, but he's not born yet. It's because Vegeta and Bulma have met way earlier on, so they eventually get to know each other a little bit more, which does end up leading to her getting pregnant. So he's almost born now. In terms of powers, everyone has also grown exponentially in power with the training they've had access to. Goku with a few days of gravity training on his way to Namek, as well as healing from his injuries with Vegeta, went from a power level of over 8,000 to 90,000, which just goes to show how effective gravity training is. It can keep being increased as well, so eventually as they adapt to higher levels of it, they can go higher and higher with the amount of gravity that they're pushing on them, so they'll get even more use out of it. Let's start by covering the humans. Chaozu's kinda out of his league right now, so we're not gonna really cover him here since he probably wouldn't be training like this. And while the Ajirobe was useful in the last part, he's starting to get a little bit lazier, but he does train. With the little gravity training that he did get, he gets to a power level of 140k, which isn't bad. Yamcha's at 240k, Krillin's at 280k, and Tien's at 340k. 
So already the humans are way more powerful than anyone they could have encountered on Namek, except Frieza, of course. Just to get a good idea of their power, Captain Ginyu was at 120k. That means Yajirobe could probably defeat him in a fight at this point. Well, that's something I never thought I would say. Anyways, the Saiyans have had better increases in their power because of their physiology and their more intense training. Now you might think these numbers are a little bit high, but remember, this is a year of constant gravity training with other partners that are as strong as them or stronger, possibly at hundreds of times normal gravity. A few Zenkais and a couple of days of gravity training took Goku from a power of 8k to 3 million in a month, or just above that, and everyone would be getting some small Zenkais in this time period. Vegeta would make the training a lot more brutal and let them know about Zenkais to make it more effective. And in case anything gets too serious, they do have Senzu Beans and can always get more. As for their power levels, let's get into that. Goten and Gohan are at a whopping 5 million each. So one of them alone is already more powerful than Goku was in his base form when he was fighting Frieza, who was at 3 million. Vegeta's at 11 million, and Goku's actually surpassed him now and is at 12 million. And don't worry, I'm not going to make the humans weaker or leave them behind. They're still going to get some use, even though they're going to be very far behind in power right now. It's mainly because the Saiyans were hogging the gravity training room, and they got more use out of it because of Zenkais and their physiology, that kind of stuff. A year of brutal training, mainly consisting of the four of them, with a few small Zenkais in between, pushed them up to this level. During this time, Vegeta and Goku have also cemented their rivalry. Vegeta isn't entirely good, obviously. I'd say he's kind of where he was when he got to Earth after Namek. This training also lets Goku and Vegeta see the true potential of hybrid Saiyans, as Gohan and Goten have shown a dramatic increase in power, and they've shown temporary moments of rage which makes them even more strong. Maybe they'll surpass Goku one day. Who knows? While Vegeta or anyone doesn't really know yet, learning about the potential of hybrids will be good for him later on once he finds out that he's going to have a son soon, another hybrid who could potentially be strong. But Vegeta is like how he was originally and isn't going to be around Bulma all the time, so he doesn't know or really care what's going on with her. At least not right now, so he'll find out about his son eventually. And with that, we're going to leave off here for now. Now I want to bring up something important, the timeline. The Namek arc originally happens in December of Age 762, specifically Goku and Frieza's fight happening on Christmas Eve. At this point in the scenario, we're currently in around November of Age 763, almost a year afterwards. Future Trunks arrives when Frieza does, which is about a year and a half after the events of Namek, but we don't know the exact month, but we can assume it's around June of Age 764. That will be important later, since this means that Trunks is going to arrive in about 6 to 7 months time. The Saiyans have been training tirelessly, but feel it wasn't enough. Even with their massive power levels, Vegeta still feels uneasy. After nearly a year of training, they feel like time is running out for them. Frieza could set his sights on Earth at any point, and if he somehow finds out Vegeta is there, it's going to be even sooner than that. Also, Chi Chi is starting to get fed up with Goku constantly taking Gohan and Goten to train for nearly a year. Both the threat of Frieza and Chi Chi are equally terrifying to Goku. Frieza has multiple transformations, and while his first form may not be too powerful for them to face, his extra forms might be. And alongside that, they have King Cold to worry about. The group was planning to just assault Frieza's planet and defeat Frieza and King Cold, but they don't think they're powerful enough right now. Goku decides to go up to Kami's lookout and ask for some advice, anything that might help them train. Kami does have an idea, and it might be very useful, but he can't guarantee it'll help everyone. He tells Goku about King Kai and how he could see if he can get King Kai to train them, but there's a bit of an issue. King Kai wouldn't want to take too many people to train, probably three at most. And if Kami were to ask King Yama, he almost certainly would exclude Vegeta from going there. But Goku doesn't necessarily feel like leaving Vegeta alone on Earth because Vegeta isn't entirely a good guy yet, and that would also mean he'd be left in the dust. But this suggestion from Kami seems like their only option to get strong quickly. But maybe Goku himself doesn't have to go. Goku returns to the group with an idea, sending Gohan and Goten to King Kai, while Goku stays and trains with Vegeta. The two kids don't really know what to think of it, but if it'll make them strong, they're excited to see what could come of it. The only reason these two are going is because of what I said before about Vegeta, and also the fact that Goku can't just leave Vegeta to do nothing, and someone needs to keep an eye on him. They could send Piccolo with the two boys, but it's unlikely that King Yama would allow him to go either because of Piccolo's past. As for any other Z fighter, they're way outclassed compared to even Gohan and Goten, so it wouldn't make much sense to send them. Gohan and Goten will go to King Kai, which will help them potentially unlock their latent powers as well as learn new techniques and how to fight more properly. 
Goku and Vegeta stay behind and go into the gravity chamber non-stop, while Kami takes the two boys to King Yama, who lets the two boys go with no hesitation at all. He can sense the promise in them and knows that they're trustworthy and good of heart, and he sends them along Snake Way. Given their power at the moment, Snake Way doesn't take too long for the boys to pass. They can fly after all, and pretty quickly. Within a day, they arrive at King Kai's planet and they face the hardest part, trying to come up with a joke for King Kai. They struggle, but they end up passing and their training begins. King Kai sees that they're already powerful right now, so instead of focusing on their power, he instead wants to focus on teaching them some techniques, fighting styles, and maybe some extreme weight training with Kachi Kachin, if the time permits. Learning of the boy's goal, as well as that of Goku and Vegeta, he feels uneasy trying to send them off to defeat Frieza, but feeling their power puts him at ease. Someone in this universe has to get rid of Frieza, and maybe these four Saiyans can help out, so he needs to strengthen these boys further. After just four months of training, King Kai feels that they've already gotten more than enough experience. The main goal of their training wasn't to make their power levels higher, but instead to give them more fighting experience and new techniques, as well as giving them more resolve and discipline to prepare them for the fight. It's a shame that King Kai couldn't train Goku and Vegeta, but those two are just glad that it might help them against Frieza. King Kai tells the boys that he'll keep tabs on them with their first fight against Frieza. Now let's give some power levels as usual. Goten and Gohan are at 10 million each, with Vegeta and Goku both at 19 million. Goku and Vegeta have kept up their gravity training over the 4 months and are now a lot stronger. Gohan and Goten didn't grow much in power like I mentioned, they only had a small increase, but by training with King Kai, they have learned the Kaioken, and as of now, they're only really good with times 5 but could use times 10 if needed with some struggle. That power should be more than enough to kill Frieza, hopefully. And the two have also learned the Spirit Bomb, if ever needed, but will only use it in dire situations. Now the group is ready. Boma ends up building a ship and preparing the group as they try to find Frieza's planet, and this takes about another month or so. The group of four then begins their journey, with some rest on the way. After a few more weeks, they arrive to the strange planet they heard about from Vegeta, Frieza Planet 79. The group suppresses their power and Vegeta leads the way. They're going to bring an ambush right to Frieza. When he sees the first soldiers he could find, he demands to see Lord Frieza, as he has some new recruits that he found off-planet. Luckily, Frieza is there in the palace at the moment, and he's surprised to see Vegeta still alive and calls him into the throne room to see what Vegeta's making commotion over. Vegeta kneels before Frieza and greets him, with the other three in tow. Frieza's a little angry. Where's Vegeta been all this time? Who are these monkeys he's brought with him? He berates Vegeta, but Vegeta only smirks. It's best to do this quick. While Frieza is still in his first form and off guard, Vegeta quickly powers up to his maximum power. Every scatter in the building explodes from it, and before Frieza can even react, he feels a beam pierce him through his chest. Only being in his first form right now, an attack from Vegeta at a power of 19 million gravely injures Frieza who is only about 530,000 right now. That was way easier than they thought it would be. Vegeta gives one last look at Frieza, feeling a mix of hatred and accomplishment now that he sees the all-powerful Lord Frieza on the ground before him. Pathetic. Vegeta charges up one last blast at Frieza and fires it. Frieza can't do anything right now. The blast completely disintegrates him and blows a hole through the side of the complex, while Goku and his sons watch in awe with a bit of terror at how Vegeta is acting. Vegeta is proud, but the mission isn't done yet. Why do all that training if they were just going to catch Frieza off guard? Well, Frieza wasn't his main concern. King Cold was. With the large blast in the area Frieza was in, the entire planet is on high alert now. The forces scramble to attack, but the Saiyans easily defend against it with no trouble. With Vegeta killing the Frieza Force soldiers while Goku and his sons just knock them out, Vegeta's getting impatient with Goku now that he's sparing these guys after all the atrocities they've committed. But before he can berate Goku, they sense a massive power approaching. King Cold has arrived and he's furious. His son is dead, and these intruders have the audacity to destroy this palace alongside it. Being confident in his abilities, he remains in his second form, which may seem like a challenge, but really, it's only a little bit stronger than suppressed Mecha Frieza as far as we know. We don't know the true extent of it, but that's just his second form, or supposed second form. We don't really know if he could transform or not, but considering Frieza and Cooler, as well as Frost even, it makes sense to think that King Cold could transform. But in his second form alone, he easily fends the Saiyans off, 
with Goku and Vegeta at max power, and then Gohan and Goten show off Kaioken. The two boys seem quite powerful and actually begin to challenge King Cold a lot. One of them alone is pretty much enough to face King Cold. Maybe this form isn't enough. King Cold then begins to grow in size and begins to transform into a horrific monster that is his third form. He wants to take out the two boys first. King Cold doesn't care about Goku and his sons as he doesn't know them and only cares about keeping Vegeta alive so he can deal him a punishment later on. He wastes no time and knocks Goku and Vegeta to the side after transforming, sending them crashing through a nearby wall and they can only watch right now as they see what's going on. The two boys power up to Kaioken times 10 again and barely are able to dodge King Cold's attacks. He's getting frustrated that he can't hit them both, so then he charges towards Goten with the intention of impaling him. Quickly, Gohan jumps in to push Goten out of the way and save him, and then he gets skewered by King Cold right through his chest, somewhat like Frieza did with Krillin. King Cold smirks, now that he's got one, and with this other kid completely paralyzed with fear looking at what happened to Gohan, he takes this opportunity to fire a death beam right at Goten now. Even with their Kaioken pushed at times 20 now, which is basically tearing them apart, they couldn't dodge or defend against these attacks. Goten is now dead, with Gohan dying quickly, now being impaled by King Cold's horn. Vegeta watches in complete disbelief, and looks over to Goku, but he sees someone he doesn't recognize. The way Kakarot looks right now isn't like anything Vegeta's ever seen from him before. Having seen Goten die in front of him, and Gohan being gravely wounded, all while he's completely helpless set something off inside of Goku. A mix of deep anger and sadness are the only things Goku can feel right now. He can't even speak. King Cole looks towards the two and gives him a grim smile, but the smile turns into a look of fear as he sees Goku. Goku lets out a deafening roar and is surrounded by an intense golden aura. The sheer force of this power right now creates a crater where he's standing. After seeing what King Cole did to his sons, Goku completely loses it. King Cole drops Gohan and begins to step back in fear. Goku fully powers up, and his hair begins to turn golden. With tears streaming down his face, Goku is now a Super Saiyan. Vegeta and King Cold already know what's going on. Gohan weakly watches this happen, happy to at least see what's going on. He couldn't save Goten, but at least Goku will finish the job now. The last thing Goku senses before completely losing it is Gohan's energy fading into nothing as Gohan dies alongside his brother. Before King Cold even knows what's going on, he feels a sharp pain in his stomach. Goku punches him with such a force that it impales the king. King Cold tries to attack but is useless. Goku, now completely berserk, begins to beat on King Cold with no remorse. He doesn't care about sparing this guy. He knows King Cold will never change. And he doesn't even want to give him the opportunity to transform further. This guy doesn't deserve to live. Vegeta grabs the bodies of Gohan and Goten and flees to his safe distance to watch in awe at the power of a Super Saiyan. In King Cold's third form, I'm going to place him at about a power of over 210 million. And Goku's power before was 19 million. Super Saiyan is a 50 times multiplier and that means Goku's at 950 million. King Cold doesn't stand a chance. The fight rages on with Goku at a clear advantage and just as quickly as it started, it's over. The palace and area around it are completely leveled, with an enraged Goku now standing over the corpse of King Cold. Goku takes one look at Vegeta, giving him a cold expression, as he falls to the ground unconscious after using up so much energy without knowing how to handle it. Vegeta doesn't know what to think of anything that just transpired. All he knows is that they have to leave right now. Vegeta looks down at King Cold next to the unconscious Goku with a look of contempt, as he grabs Kakarot and the two kids and weakly takes them back to the ship. Vegeta is barely able to make it and get a senzu bean for himself, but is dreading giving one to Goku as he doesn't know what will happen when he wakes up. Will he go berserk again? Will Vegeta have to tell him what happened with his sons? He ponders and launches the ship first, and tries to think of what to do as they head back to Earth. After over four months of training with King Kai, the month of waiting and the long journey towards Frieza's planet, over six months have passed in total since the beginning of this part. Back on Earth, the Z fighters are now gathered around a power that they sense not too far away. They see a boy with purple hair and a sword, looking very confused as to what's going on. He asks if the group knows anything about Frieza or where Goku is right now. Well, they don't know when he'll be back, but they know that he's fighting Frieza right now, with Vegeta, Gohan, and Goten. But everyone on Earth is still alive, shouldn't they be dead if Goku is only on Namek with Frieza right now? Also, who's Goten? 
and he sees Bola too, who's obviously about to give birth to himself way earlier than he should be born. Vegeta is in a tough spot right now. Yeah, he's proud that he was able to defeat Frieza, but also angry at himself for not being able to do more against King Cold, and the fact that Goku surpassed him. But the biggest emotions that he feels right now is a mix of guilt and fear, because of Gohan and Goten's death, and the fact that he now has to deal with a grieving Goku. Goku is still unconscious, and Vegeta needs to give him a Senzu to heal him, but he's kind of fearful of how Goku will react when he wakes up. Knowing that he has to act and do something, he gives Goku a Senzu bean and jumps back immediately as he becomes conscious again. Goku is startled to see that he's on the ship, only remembering a bit of what happened. His memories start to come back, and his confusion turns to anger and sadness, but he eventually collects himself. While he is, of course, really sad, the Dragon Balls are still active on Earth, and his son's going to be revived, so not all is lost. The issue is Goku will have to live with the fact that they died here and he couldn't do anything to help, at least not until it was too late. Vegeta then asks him about that power he used. He believes he knows what it is. Goku couldn't control it and didn't willingly activate it of course, but now that Vegeta brings it up again, it has the two of them interested. Maybe he could try to use this form again, and use it to become more powerful in the future, same with Vegeta, who realized this is what a Super Saiyan is. Their journey back will take a few more weeks, so in the meantime, the two of them can focus on figuring this power out for themselves. Back on Earth, Trunks is beginning to fill everyone in on who he is and why he's here. Knowing that Bulma is pregnant already, he has no need to hide his identity as Bulma and Vegeta's son this time around. He didn't expect the timeline to be like this. Gohan and Vegeta are absent, same with Frieza and King Cold, and Goku should have returned by now as well. After learning about the fact that they were fighting Frieza right now and they won't be back for a few weeks, Trunks can't stay. He gives Bulma all the information about the androids, and the group decides they'll act upon it once Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Goten are back. As for Goku's heart virus, like my other videos, I'm going to keep it in the storyline because it's never really confirmed what caused him to get the virus. As far as we know, he could have gotten it from living in the woods as a kid. It's never explicitly confirmed that he got it on Yardrat, so even though he's not going to Yardrat, he still has to worry about the heart virus in the future. Trunks leaves now, trusting that the group will do well, and will return in three years to make sure everything is okay. At least he hopes so. This timeline is very far off from his original, so he can only hope for the best. All while this is happening, Gohan and Goten are in the afterlife, and of course, the first thing they do is go to see King Kai again. Being his students, King Kai is obviously very welcoming to them, and he could tell people on Earth to revive them right away, but the twins actually ask him not to tell people just yet. With the few weeks that they have until Goku and Vegeta return to Earth, and inevitably revive them, they want to spend some time in the afterlife training. They want to see if they can learn any more techniques or get stronger somehow. King Kai tells them that he has nothing left to teach in terms of techniques, as they have both learned Kaioken and the Spirit Bomb already. There is that Super Saiyan thing Goku did, but obviously King Kai knows nothing about how it works or how they can access it, or even if they can. In terms of learning new moves or techniques, King Kai decides to help the kids out and wants to see if he could find anyone in the afterlife who can teach them some stuff. There's many strong people in the afterlife, so he can help the twins find someone with the few weeks that they have and give them some more training in the meantime, either to make them stronger or let them learn a new technique. After a few weeks pass, Goku and Vegeta arrive on Earth again, but worry everyone else as they're the only ones on the ship and there's no Gohan or Goten. The two explain what happened, and while saddened by it, they immediately go to collect the Dragon Balls to bring them back. This is when King Kai actually comes in to tell Goku that the two have kept their bodies in the afterlife and have been training, and they're ready to come back now since they know they have to. After Goku and Vegeta are filled in about trunks and everything, the search begins and they collect the Dragon Balls. Gohan and Goten are revived, and while they only have one wish, they're able to phrase it so that it brings both the kids back. The two of them thank King Kai and the others that they've met in the afterlife as they prepare to head back home. Their experience here was pretty successful as they got stronger and they picked up some new things. On the other hand, Goku now has access to Super Saiyan at will, but it's only grade 1 obviously, and Vegeta is actually on track to unlocking it as well. On their trip back, he showed signs of accessing it, but he isn't quite there yet. But with a little training, he should be able to get it pretty soon. So about the androids, the group knows they can try and find the androids and have begun research as to where they could be. However, Goku actually turns this idea down and he says that they should let the androids be activated. Vegeta also agrees because, well, he's Vegeta. And with them, Gohan and Goten agree because they want to practice with their new power. At first, 
Everyone thinks they're insane after what just happened, but then the rest of the Z Fighters slowly start to agree. They saw how powerful the four Saiyans got, so maybe they can do some training and get a lot stronger as well. Bulma has also just given birth to Trunks, and obviously, he's not doing anything right now, but it's worth mentioning that he's been born a few years earlier than normal. Training begins in the three years, and now power levels are irrelevant, so I'm just going to use power scaling from now on like I do in my other videos. Goku is the strongest of the group, with Vegeta close behind, and underneath him are Gohan and Goten who are equal in power. And just for some canon comparisons, Gohan and Goten are actually stronger than where Goku is in canon at this point. Goku and Vegeta are Super Saiyans and have been training a lot in that form. They're way stronger than they are in the canon. When fighting King Cold, for example, Goku was multiple times stronger than he was in canon. Vegeta also has Super Saiyan earlier on, and the two have been making use of it. And of course, Gohan and Goten have tapped into the Super Saiyan during the three years. Given how active they are with fighting and training in the scenario, it's not really out there to assume that they unlock Super Saiyan with three years of training. They of course have Kaioken like normal, and can do about times 20 right now, but Super Saiyan is much better. Maybe in the future they'll be able to combine the two and access Super Kaioken, but for now, Super Saiyan is more than enough for them and they'd rather focus on that. The humans are also much stronger than they are in canon and have continued training. Because of the trip to Frieza's planet, they have a month less of training, but their training is actually more effective so they can benefit way more than they do in the original story, even with less time. After the three years pass, the androids finally arrive. In the city, a group is sent to find them, and of course, 19 and 20 are found. Yamcha is the first to find one of them, and he finds Jiro, and he tries to kill Yamcha, and while he's way outmatched, Yamcha is actually able to survive the attack this time and not get a hole in his chest. He is injured still, but he's better off than he was in the original story, because, you know, anything's better than having a gaping hole in your chest. The group heads outside of the city to fight the androids after encountering them, and this encounter goes pretty much like normal. Goku feels very confident about fighting 19, but succumbs to the heart virus and has to be brought back home like usual. After Vegeta brutally kills Android 19, Jiro makes his escape, and that's when Trunks appears. Everything is pretty normal so far. The group follows Jiro to his lab, and they are present for the awakening of the androids who killed Jiro, and now they're faced with fighting these guys. After following them a bit outside of where the lab is, they're able to stop the androids in their tracks and actually start to put up a fight. And I mean, it's not really a fight, it's kind of one-sided. Vegeta goes up first against 18, and he does a lot better than he did normally. He isn't strong enough to beat her, but he's able to hold his own. And 18 is actually pretty shocked at how strong Vegeta is. But they're not worried yet, since they still have the upper hand. And when you consider that Vegeta is the strongest of the group, and they're doing pretty well against him, there's nothing really to worry about. No one stands a chance. They defeat everyone present except for the kids and Krillin, who all haven't fought yet. Having been successful in easily defeating everyone, the androids then prepare to leave. But then, Goten and Gohan try to stop them. 17 and 18, not knowing who these kids are, respond to this rebellion by laughing when they see it's just two little kids standing up to them. The two androids obviously don't take the kids seriously, but then, the two kids go Super Saiyan and attack Android 17 together. Now, it's twins versus twins. 17 doesn't have any trouble defending against them, but he admits that they seem pretty strong for kids and that he underestimated them. Gohan and Goten are then thrown into a nearby rock as the androids leave, but the two kids aren't done yet. They haven't shown anyone this, but they want to test out one of the techniques they learned in the afterlife. They're not sure if they can pull it off or how effective it'll be, since they haven't tried it for about a year ever since they were in the middle of training, but it's worth a shot. If it turns out to be helpful, they can teach everyone this later. The two stand back and get into position, hoping that they don't mess it up. The rest of the Z Fighters don't want them to keep fighting, but they notice the odd movements they're doing now. They stretch their arms out, step towards each other, and then connect their fingers, while saying something about fusion. I'm sure you guys know where I'm going with this. Gohan and Goten, in the afterlife, learn the fusion dance, and they have been practicing it secretly as their ultimate move. This catches the attention of the androids, and they turn back to see one kid in a vest standing there instead of two. The fusion of Goten and Gohan, Goton, is now born. The Z Fighters are of course speechless, not knowing what happened to Gohan and Goten just now. They can sense the power of this new fighter and realize how massively powerful he is. The androids aren't really that scared because they don't sense the power of this new fighter, but they're more so confused that they saw one new kid standing there instead of two. 
They didn't see what happened, they just turned around when they heard some noise after the fact. They don't really care though, they just assume these two kids pulled some trick to switch out with this new kid, and it's getting annoying. Maybe we should kill this one and teach the other two a lesson. Android 17 says this as he prepares to fight, and is then kicked in the face with such a massive force that he's sent flying. Keep in mind, Gotan is only in base at this point. If you saw my video breaking down the power of fusions, which I'll link at the top of this video, you'll remember that we covered the fact that fusions are at bare minimum tens of times stronger than the sum of their parts. So this one fusion dance alone is multiple times stronger than Super Saiyan, Gohan, and Goten combined. You'll see more of his power as we continue the fight. Shocked to see how easily the kid hit 17 like that, 18 prepares to fight as 17 gets back up and prepares himself. The twin androids begin attacking the twin fusion, who is enjoying himself with his fight. Having tried the fusion on their own before, they know that it only lasts for about 30 minutes, and less when they expel more energy, so they shouldn't waste any time here. Gotan then powers up to Super Saiyan and begins to absolutely demolish 17 and 18. While 16 isn't really one to get involved in fights, he has been shown to protect his friends. And since he takes a liking to 17 and 18, I feel he'd step in here and protect the other two. Gotan badly injures 17 and 18, and is about to knock the two out instead of killing them. 16's distraction allows the other two androids to escape, as 16 now faces Gotan, but even 16 isn't strong enough, and Gotan knows he needs to take out the other androids, so he tries to make his fight with 16 quick. Even though 16 is stronger than 17 or 18, he's only one challenger, and Gotan has a relatively easy time. 16 sees no way of winning, and instead decides to blow himself up. That took a turn really quick. 16 grabs onto Gotan, and the fused child is now freaking out knowing what's about to happen. The Z Fighters run, with Gotan being able to delay the blast, break free of 16's hold by ripping through his arms, and barely escaping the explosion as he flies off. He's terrified now as he sees the blast in the distance, and he's done fighting for now. He kinda took down one of the androids, and defeated the two others, so he'll count this as a win. He could've killed the other two, but he didn't want to. Remember, this fusion is part Gohan, and also Goten's pretty much the same. They wouldn't be the ones to kill people, especially since the androids are partially human. And 16 was the one to kill himself, so they didn't really do anything bad here. The Z Fighters who were in the area are amazed at this technique, seeing how effective it was in this fight. Gohan and Goten didn't even show off their full power as this fusion, and they still demolished the same androids that dispatched everyone earlier on. The androids have been scared off for now, and they need to recover, so everyone actually has some time to regroup before moving ahead. And Goku should be safe for now, so maybe it would be a good idea to train. This gives an idea to a few characters. One is Piccolo, who never ended up fusing with Nail in this timeline. But Kami's been watching, and after seeing the power of this fusion, he sends a telepathic message to Piccolo. Remembering that his father and Kami were fused a long time ago into one stronger being, Piccolo now realizes what Kami's getting at. If the fusion for Gohan and Goten was that powerful, maybe it would be the same for Piccolo if he merged with Kami once again. Because while the fusion dance for Gohan and Goten only lasts for 30 minutes, the fusion of Piccolo and Kami would end up lasting forever. Piccolo needs to think this over, but he decides to visit Kami anyways and talk with him, much to Kami's delight. As for the rest of the group, Trunks suggests to Vegeta that they should learn fusion, but Vegeta obviously turns it down. Krillin would like to, but his height isn't similar to anyone except for Gohan and Goten, and he wouldn't be able to fuse with anyone else. But during this brief training period, Tien was actually influenced by seeing Gohan and Goten fuse, and he mentioned it to Yamcha once they got back to Goku's house, seeing if he could be a potential fusion partner if they ended up learning it. Tien actually asked Gohan and Goten about it, and instead of training normally to power up during these brief few days, Tien and Yamcha instead try to learn the fusion dance for themselves. As for Piccolo, he does end up finding out about Namekian fusion, and Kami mentions how much stronger he can get from it, at the cost of them being merged permanently and not having Dragon Balls. It's a lot to think about, but Piccolo doesn't go through with it just yet. He wants to make sure the Dragon Balls are still here just in case they need them after fighting the androids. And once peace is assured, then he'll probably merge with Kami. As for the androids, they're actually hiding out for now, trying to recover after that fight. What was that kid they fought? Where's 16 at? Where's Goku? They have a lot on their mind, but instead of making themselves known, they decide to head out until they're feeling better. While 16 is dead, there's still one more android lurking about. Cell, of course, is here again, and since I don't like to alter the extra timelines in these videos, much like future Trunks, I'm going to keep Cell's timeline pretty much the same. That means Cell still has the DNA of Frieza and King Cold, despite them not visiting Earth in this timeline for this scenario. 
So this is pretty much the same cell we see in canon. He's searching for the androids but is having no luck, and eventually encounters Piccolo, with a brief dispute going pretty much like normal, except Piccolo's not really able to defend himself as well. Seeing how powerful this guy is, Piccolo doesn't even try to face off against him and he just leaves, barely escaping with his life. Realizing that this guy was the work of Dr. Jiro, he and the group decide to do some digging at Jiro's lab and find the present version of Cell and the blueprint for the androids, so they end up destroying the lab and around this time, Goku ends up waking up, since some more time has passed. Having updated him on what happened, he's proud of his sons being able to use this new way of fighting, but also concerned since the group has a few potential threats lurking about. The group ends up searching around in groups and after some time, Piccolo, Tien, and Yamcha are the ones to run into Cell. They alert everyone else by raising their key, and everyone is on the move. They won't let Cell escape this time. Piccolo powers up further as Tien and Yamcha break out the fusion dance which they learned from Gohan and Goten, and are surprised at how well it works. Piccolo is able to serve as a brief distraction for Cell, in order for Tien and Yamcha to perform the dance. When he's about to attack Piccolo, Cell then turns around and he sees what's happened with Tien and Yamcha. There's not two of them standing there, but one. He doesn't have any data on this fighter, but then he realizes what happened. They merged. The resulting fusion is Tiencha, one that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about from the video games. Tiencha is actually quite strong. Obviously he's nowhere near the level of Goton, but I would place him above any other individual fighter, and below base Goton. Alongside Piccolo, Tiencha attacks Cell, and they both remain wary of Cell's tail, as well as the fusion time limit. They're actually winning against Cell, and the arc takes a turn here once Tiencha uses his full power and fires a Shin Kikoho. In the original story, this move from Tien was briefly able to hold back a semi-perfect Cell, but it didn't really do any damage, it basically just paralyzed him. And in this story, not only is Tien stronger, but he's fused with the Yamcha, who's also stronger as well, and they get the fusion boost on top of that, and if that's not enough, they're not even fighting semi-perfect Cell, they're up against imperfect Cell. After firing a few beams, Tiencha is exhausted and actually ends up defusing, but surprisingly, they try to search for Cell's key or any trace of him, and there's no trace of him left at all. They actually ended up killing Cell. Even with his regeneration, the power of multiple attacks like that completely destroyed the android. As soon as the rest of the fighters arrive, they're greeted with Piccolo, Tien, and Yamcha, all worn out, but celebrating as they actually killed Cell together. The three of them give a thumbs up and smile towards the group, with everyone laughing in celebration. That's great, but the androids are still lurking somewhere. No one knows where they are, but the androids won't actually be a problem at all. Maybe they won't even have to kill the two androids. It doesn't really feel right to do that because they are part human still. And judging by the plans from Dr. Jiro and what they found in his lab, they weren't made androids willingly. They were basically made as slaves for Jiro and used really as test subjects in order to kill Goku. And since 19, 20, Cell, and 16 are all gone, 17 and 18 don't really pose a threat either in terms of power. Cell was the strongest one they encountered, and if they're able to kill him, then they could definitely handle 17 and 18 if they need to. Maybe they can extend an olive branch and have the android surrender, and possibly help them turn to their side. They are still human after all. So with Cell defeated now, the rest of the Z Fighters now have to go out and find the androids. If they have to defeat them, then so be it. But they need to find them first, they don't know where the androids are hiding out now. As for the androids themselves, they're actually closer than the Z Fighters know. They've been trying to observe what's been going on, and seeing if they could find any ways to defeat the group. They're intimidated at the fact that this other android, Cell, appeared, and they couldn't sense his power, but they could tell that he was actually really strong, and the fact that they were able to kill Cell was really worrying for the two androids. However, the two of them aren't out of the fight yet. They keep observing, and they're planning to strike back, attempting to find out any ways to defeat this group. They'll enact their revenge eventually. Even if Cell's gone, these two remain as the new threat, but we'll save what they do for the next part. The appearance and defeat of Cell was unexpected and pretty much came out of nowhere, but the group is glad that it didn't go too badly. Trunks especially benefits from this because he now knows that Cell will probably appear in his timeline too, though he doesn't know how, but assumes it involves something with his time machine. This also gets Trunks to realize, while this timeline is doing well right now, he has no real method for saving his timeline yet. So far, only fusions have been useful against the androids, but Trunks has no use for it at the moment because he hasn't learned it yet, and he has no one to fuse with. However, Bulma might have a solution. After raiding Jiro's lab and finding all his plans for the androids, and how each of the two androids have the bomb in them, they're starting to get an idea. 
Assuming this remains true in the future timeline, Bulma suggests that Trunks uses a self-destruct button to kill the androids in his timeline. This same method of self-destruction could be used in this timeline, should the group decide to actually kill them using that method. While the group is very unsure and hesitant about using it in this timeline, given that the androids can still be redeemed here and seem different from Trunks' androids, Trunks takes up Bulma on this offer and has her make a remote as well as a copy of the androids' blueprints in case future Bulma needs it. This was pretty simple. Trunks can just go back to his timeline and use the button to defeat the androids, and they will be gone for good. As for Cell, he should be fine. He plans to hunt down Jero's lab and find Cell before he's even born, so he doesn't even become a threat in the future. And if Cell's already awoken and it's too late, it's not really that big of a deal either, because he won't be nearly strong enough at that point to face Trunks. He probably wouldn't be alive long enough to get anywhere close to where his imperfect form was. He might even still be in that larval stage that he had to revert to to use the time machine. Trunks is content, but the Z Fighters still have another problem, that being the androids of this timeline. Well, the easy option here would be to blow them up, but there's a bit of protest here. While the androids in Trunks' timeline definitely deserve it, there's a moral question here about whether or not the androids here do as well. They haven't really done anything yet except fight the Z Fighters, and then they just started hiding out. Trunks even saw that they weren't like the 17 and 18 from his timeline. Gohan and Goten give some pushback and say that they don't necessarily feel it's right either, considering that they're still humans and just have been corrupted by Jiro. Otherwise, they would have just killed the androids right away. Krillin also gives some pushback, feeling pretty much the same way he did in the original story. Goku's proud to see his sons think like this, and considering it's something that he would say as well, he agrees with his sons and Krillin. Vegeta is really the only one who doesn't agree, but he'd rather fight them himself rather than using the remote. With everyone else giving their opinion, it's ultimately decided that they won't blow up the androids, and will instead track them down and try to compromise. Maybe if they tell the androids about all the stuff Jiro did to them, with the bombs and all and how they could reverse it, maybe the androids will take it as a sign of peace. Who knows? If they do have to fight the androids, however, they're ready for that. If the androids don't want to accept peace, then so be it. They'll have to take them out with force. Thanks to some work by Bulma with her use of the blueprints, they're able to find a way to track down the androids, and the Z Fighters use it to hunt them down. And the androids aren't actually too far. They're able to find the general location of the two androids, and the Z Fighters are surprised to see that the androids are actually pretty close to where they were just a moment ago. They end up confronting the androids, and extend an olive branch for them asking to surrender, and they find out what's been going on. The androids have been observing everyone fighting. They originally did it to find out who that fighter was that got 16 killed, but eventually, they are able to find out about Cell, and saw that the fighter was actually made with fusion. They kept their distance after finding out what Cell was here to do, and they don't know that he's dead yet. While they want to learn fusion themselves, they weren't able to actually find out how to do it correctly since they got scared off by Cell's presence, but their surveillance still gives them an advantage. They know the trick behind it, and how to stop it from happening. The Z Fighters are a little stronger now, but they have Gohan and Goten to go face the androids first because they're the strongest right now. Well, at least when they're fused, that is. Goton is definitely the best option at the moment. Knowing how fusion requires them to be together, this is where the android surveillance comes in handy. They're able to split Gohan and Goten up before they can even fuse, and begin fighting them one on one. This causes the rest of the group to split up as well and fight the androids. The androids brutally attack the group, with each subgroup barely being able to hold the individual androids off. The two of them are set on attacking Goku right now. However, the tide turns because of a mistake the androids made. They got cocky after splitting Gohan and Goten up, but since their surveillance on the group ended early, they didn't know that two other people knew fusion. During the fight, Tien and Yamcha departed briefly, and when the androids see what they're doing, it's too late. Tiencha is back in the battle, and he actually saves the day here. He was strong enough to defeat Cell, so taking on the androids here is no problem for him. This also gives Gohan and Goten the opportunity to fuse as well, and now the androids are really out of luck. They're defeated again this time, against two fusions, with no escape. But the Z Fighters don't end up killing them. The two androids ask why the Z Fighters don't just kill them now, and that's when they explain. Goku actually steps in and is the one to tell them why. He tells them what everyone found out about Jiro, and how he basically brainwashed them into being how they are, and even put bombs in them. They weren't willingly evil, at least not entirely, so the group doesn't want to really hold them wholly responsible for it. The group saw the human side to the androids, and thought that maybe it didn't have to be this way. They wouldn't feel right killing them, and would rather help. Not wanting to accept the help, but realizing that Goku is right about everything, the androids just get up and attempt to leave, and no one stops them. The androids know that they'll never be able to defeat this group, and are starting to consider what Goku just said to them and reconsidering their actions. Goku was right, it's not too late for them to change, and they might not want to be good like that, 
but they also don't want to be slaves to Duro even after he's dead. They want to be their own people. And besides, if they do end up winning somehow, the group knows about the bombs in them and could possibly set them off as a last resort to kill the androids. While they're still antagonists, the androids silently gave up and realized that it's pointless to fight, as well as them realizing that they don't want to be what Jero forced them to be. This is the first step to them actually reforming as people, but it'll be a long process and a long time before they're actually fully good like they are toward the end of Z, and they're still bad right now. But they've seized their actions and gave up on their goal of killing everyone for the moment, and decided to take a different approach at life. They're still young, and they have a lot of time ahead of them, so why don't they just live as humans like they once did before? The group is content that it turned out like this, and that ends the Android Saga in this timeline. Trunks thanks everyone and heads back to his time. While he got a bit stronger, he ends up seeking the safer option of using the remotes to kill the androids in his timeline. After returning, he gives the blueprints to Bulma, and she makes adjustments to the remote to make sure it works in this timeline in case there's any inconsistencies with the build of the androids. And it ends up working. Trunks encounters the two of them again, but it's a really short encounter. He defeats them with the press of a button, literally, without hesitation either. He ends up hunting down Jero's lab next, and sees that Cell is broken out and has been born, although it's very recently. With everything that he found at the lab, and by searching the immediate area, he's able to actually find where Cell is, although he's only in his larval form and hasn't evolved to his imperfect form yet, since he was only born just recently. Trunks kills him with no issues whatsoever, and that's pretty much it for this timeline. The androids are gone, and everything begins to be rebuilt, and Trunks has the happy ending that he wanted. Back in the main timeline, everything goes pretty well too. While they don't need the Dragon Balls, Piccolo ultimately decided against fusing with Kami here, in case they do need them in the future. In the last part, I mentioned that he considered it, but went against it because it would mean no Dragon Balls. Given that no one here has been to Namek yet and they don't know for sure if Namek has its own set, they decided for now to not fuse in order to keep the Dragon Balls around. Besides, they don't actually need the power right now, since the androids are gone. Everyone at this point is actually weaker than normal, except for the humans who pretty much got the same training. Piccolo never fused with Kami and got stronger, Vegeta and Goku never used the Time Chamber, and by extension, Goten and Gohan never used it either, same with Trunks. So they haven't mastered Super Saiyan yet. But realizing that there's something beyond Super Saiyan, over the next 7 years, Goku and Vegeta train together to access it. As I stated earlier in the series, Vegeta is already at a point where he's essentially like how he was in the late Buu Saga or in Dragon Ball Super, and he's completely good now, and is Goku's rival. The two get along now and consistently train together, usually in the gravity chamber. They end up accessing mastered Super Saiyan, and after some more training, they're aware of Super Saiyan 2's existence, but they don't know how to utilize it to its full potential at will yet. As for Gohan and Goten, they grow up during this time frame, but haven't been training too consistently. Chi Chi encourages them to pursue a school life, and they do train from time to time, but not nearly as much as before. They still end up mastering Super Saiyan, and they're actually pretty even with Goku and Vegeta in terms of power. But like I said, due to them going to school now, they end up slacking off a bit. The twins also begin to form their own identities and become a little more unique. Gohan is pretty much like how he was at the beginning of the Buu Saga, while Goten's personality is a lot like how he was in the end of Z and GT, where he's more outgoing and not as school focused as Gohan, but the two are still very close obviously. During their school life, the two of them end up encountering crime from time to time in the city, and they fight together as the quote unquote golden warriors. It's pretty fun to basically be superheroes, but eventually, a girl in their class, Videl, tries to find out the identities of these two heroes. Goten is spooked by this and bails out of being a hero, no longer wanting to do that stuff and be caught. But Gohan gets an idea for himself where he can keep doing it without worrying about Videl catching him, at least for now. And thus, Gohan gets Bulma to make him a costume and the Great Saiyan Man is born. Gohan asks Goten to join him as the Great Saiyan Man too, but Goten declines because he thinks the costume looks goofy and he doesn't really want to run around in a costume all day. Ah oh well, more spotlight for Gohan to be a hero then. The two of them continue their school lives as normal, both being in the same class and having the same friend group. However, Videl is getting closer and closer to finding out the identity of the great Saiyan man, and Goten tries to help his brother out, but he can't really do that much. He knew it was a bad idea, and he's glad that he didn't get roped into it. But we'll cover the rest of the Saiyan man saga next time, and the Buu saga after that. This is where we'll end this part for now. For the following days, the great Saiyan man is spotted around the city more and more. Gohan's friend group and Goten would often point out that they've been seeing the same man do different things, noticing that he's appearing a lot more frequently. Goten tries to help Gohan out and hide the identity, being one of the few who actually knows who he is, but he can only do so much. He's gotten a lot busier recently for reasons, and I'll explain that in a bit, but he can't always be there to act as a distraction for Gohan when needed. 
Videl is especially interested in finding out the identity of the Great Saiyaman and begins pursuing the hero more and more. Eventually, she figures it out. She realizes that Gohan is the Great Saiyaman and wants to learn why he's so strong and how he could fly and stuff like that. They end up seeing each other after school, forming somewhat of a bond and a relationship as Gohan begins to teach her what Ki is and how to fly. And it's nice for him to begin training again too, because recently, Goten hasn't been around as much to train. Having Videl there is good, and on the flip side, let's actually look at Goten for a bit. Ever since they began going to school, Goten and Gohan have become a lot more unique from each other, both in looks and personality, as well as interests. In case you're wondering why Goten's been so busy recently, there's a good reason for it. While Gohan is only just now starting to see Videl and forming a relationship with her, well, due to the fact that Goten is a lot more extroverted than his brother, he already has a girlfriend. Yeah, Goten has actually been pretty successful this time around in terms of finding a girl that he likes, especially since he has a lot more free time than Gohan, and doesn't have to deal with the whole same man nonsense and going out as that a lot. He has a lot more time to be social and like. While Gohan is with Videl, Goten is now with Eresa. Yep, we're gonna make her relevant. Given the fact that Eresa seems to be a lot more extroverted than someone like Videl even, and the fact that she falls more in line with what Goten is like, the two of them actually hit it off pretty well and they start dating. So now, both of the brothers are having good lives in this peacetime. School is going well, they don't have enemies to fight, Goten has a girlfriend, and Gohan is close to having one. And one day while training with Videl, Goku ends up bursting out of the house to tell Gohan something. Oh yeah, that's another good thing, Goku's alive this time around. But I'm sure you could already tell that from the last episode. Anyways, he interrupts the two during their training. He tells Gohan something about the World Tournament, and saying that it's going to be starting soon and how he wants Gohan to join. Videl also remembers this and asks Gohan to do the same, and Gohan of course agrees. It could be fun to fight in a tournament after all this time of peace. Goku's thrilled that Gohan accepted, and now he's going to talk to some of the other people. Besides someone like Goten, he has other people that he wants to ask to join. Time passes, and eventually the tournament does end up arriving. Overall, the people joining are pretty much the same. One thing that comes as a shocker to everyone is that Android 18 is there. Wait, what? It was a very small point in part 5, but I mentioned that Krillin never actually fought the androids like normal during their encounter. Right before they departed, yeah, Android 18 and Krillin still had their little interaction where she kisses him, and that made him fall for her. This also was a small factor in why Krillin decided that they shouldn't kill the android in part 7, alongside the fact that he didn't feel right killing them for various other reasons, but partially because he also kind of liked 18. So yeah, they still end up getting together. The funny thing about it is a lot of people thought I would set up Goten with her, but I don't really see that happening. And I feel Reisa is a much better option for Goten, and it makes a lot more sense. And it's also a lot less weird. The only difference this time is that Mighty Mask no longer joins the fight, since he's replaced by Goten who's pretty much a shoe in for the tournament. Pintar and Jula are replaced as well, this time with two new contestants, Tien and Yamcha. Yamcha is much more motivated to train and fight in this timeline, and starts to do it more and more on the side when he's not busy with baseball or whatever Yamcha's up to these days. The events of the Cell Saga acted as a good motivator for him, and with Yamcha consistently training, Tien is around more often and is back at the World Tournament. Instead of training somewhere alone with Chiaotzu, he's with his friends this time. And obviously, unlike Videl, Eresa isn't a fighter, but she's there with her friends like normal to watch and cheer Goten on, as well as her friend Videl. And given that Goten is in the tournament without an alias, Gohan decides it's pointless to register as the Saiyaman, and actually registers under his real name since everyone knows it's him anyways. You know, if Goten's not hiding who he is, why should Gohan? In terms of the kids bracket, well, I'm just gonna say now it's pretty much rigged. Trunks enters it, and he wins pretty easily, since he's really the only powerful one there. I'm gonna take a little detour here and say that I haven't gotten to talk about Trunks a lot in this scenario either, since there hasn't been that much of an opportunity, and I feel like this is a good time to actually start talking about that. Trunks was born soon after future Trunks arrived in his timeline, which I covered earlier on. He's a few years older here, but not too much older. He's still a kid. It's not like he's a complete teenager yet, but he's older than before. From time to time, he hangs out with Gohan and Goten, who are basically like big brother figures to him. Of course, he trains with them occasionally, but does a lot more training with Vegeta, at least when Vegeta isn't training with Goku. Sadly though, sadly though, there's not too much remarkable to cover about him as of now. Sure, he and Goten are friends still, but their friendship is a lot different from where it was in the original story. Same with him and Gohan, but they're all very close regardless. Trunks is like their little brother due to how close their families are, so they often get to see him and train with him. Since he's been pretty much solo this whole time, 
Trunks isn't 100% like his normal self either, and it's pretty much for the good part. Kid Trunks in the original story is kinda cocky like his dad, and sometimes seems like a spoiled kid, well, at least in my opinion, but here though, he's a lot more disciplined as a kid, not really being the top dog like he was when Goten was around. He's sorta in between Kid Trunks from the main series and Kid Future Trunks in terms of personality. He's a lot more mature to say the least, and while there's not really much to talk about in terms of him for right now, he's gonna be important later on, and he'll be able to play a bigger role than he does originally. Anyways, the tournament begins and it goes pretty normal. However, something's kinda off. Those two guys, Spopovich and Yamu, are creeping everyone out, and same for those two other guys that joined, Shin and Kibito. They're suspicious and people are especially weirded out by the upcoming fights. Piccolo immediately forfeits against Shin like normal, not wanting to fight this guy after he comes face to face with him. Weird. Next is Spopovich against Videl, and I'll spare you all the details, but sadly for her, the fight goes pretty much like normal. Goten and Goku are able to calm Gohan down and prevent him from lashing out, but Gohan is still furious like normal. As soon as the fight ends, he gets a Senzu Bean for Videl and heals her, so all is good. Following this, Gohan is against Kibito and shows off his power. A lot of you are understandably curious about it, so let's actually get into some powers for this point in time. Gohan and Goten are pretty even, and are actually just behind Goku and Vegeta. Goku and Vegeta have Super Saiyan 2, and are relatively on par with themselves from the main story. Even with the less tense Android Saga, the two of them being alive and able to train together allows for them to have a more effective training. The only big difference is that Goku doesn't know about or have access to Super Saiyan 3. Gohan and Goten have had some light training during the time skip, and they were able to get a bit stronger because of it. They're around as strong as Gohan was in the saga in the original story, which is pretty good. Nothing too crazy overall. However, the fact that they have access to Kaioken allows them to briefly surpass that limit, but they haven't focused as much on Kaioken ever since they fought Frieza in Cold. They have learned how to use Super Kaioken, but it's not really useful in the long run. It's very strenuous for them to use, especially with Super Saiyan, and it will damage them badly if they don't keep it under control. When in dire need, they have the option to use it, but it's not like they're going to be using Super Kaioken times 20 for everyone they fight. In short bursts though, it is somewhat useful, but it literally tears their insides apart if they use it too much due to all the stress it causes. So to avoid their bones from turning into dust, it's not something they're going to use constantly. Back to the actual fight, or lack thereof of a fight, Gohan vs. Kibito goes pretty normally, the whole energy stealing thing happens, and there's nothing really of note here. Everyone goes to chase after the two Majin servants, and this time, Goten, Tien, and Yamcha are present. Videl stays back this time and doesn't attempt to go along, since Gohan wants to make sure that she stays safe, and Goten wants her to stick with Eresa just in case. Understandably, Eresa is worried about Goten, but he assures her they'll be fine. Especially after what just happened to Gohan, her and Videl are pretty nervous about what might happen to them. Trunks wants to go along too, but Gohan and Goten make sure he stays back as well. They don't want to see him get hurt at all, and they know he's motivated to go, but in case things turn bad, he shouldn't really be there, and he should remain here to protect the others anyways. Trunks understands and he stays back with everyone else, with the rest of the group going off to find Bobbity. They arrive at the ship and watch as Spopovich and Yamu are killed by Bobbity right away, and they see a mysterious pink man sitting there in front of the ship. No, not Boo, the other pink guy, Deborah. Wow. They actually got over half the power they needed for Boo, about 60% this time. As Bobbity goes inside with Pui Pui, this man then turns around and then launches himself towards the group. Immediately, Deborah is now in front of them and he erases Kibito from existence with a single blast. Deborah has now asserted his dominance, and he turns his head towards the group and prepares to turn someone into stone. Shin yells for everyone to watch out for his spit, but it's too late. Deborah smirks and spits towards Piccolo, and Piccolo braces himself, but it never actually does hit him. Piccolo opens his eyes, and he sees what happened. Someone jumped in front of him, wanting to save his friend, and in order to make sure the Dragon Ball stays safe, Gohan jumped in front of Piccolo to save him. Remember, there's no Dende on Earth in this timeline. Kami is still Earth's guardian, and Piccolo is linked with him, and the Dragon Balls are still the same as before. It's imperative that they protect Piccolo. The spit lands directly on Gohan's chest, as he begins to turn into stone. Before being fully turned into a statue, he smiles to everyone, thinking that this is the end for him, and he says he's counting on everyone to defeat Bobbidi and Deborah. Everyone, especially Goku and Piccolo, are mortified to see Gohan turn into stone, but before anyone could react, someone else reacts completely differently and lunges at Deborah before he can even make a witty remark. After instantly powering to Super Saiyan 2, Goten is now facing the Demon King, trying to avenge his brother. 
Not only is he in Super Saiyan 2, but he's stronger than before, because his outburst gave him a temporary rage boost, much like we'd see with Gohan. Goten is understandably furious. Remembering the time that Gohan saved him from a brutal death at the hands of King Cold, Goten is furious at both Deborah and himself for letting this happen. Goku is also enraged, but yells for Goten to get back, not wanting to lose both his sons in one day, just like he did before. But Shin calms Goku down and tells him that this might actually help. If Goten can defeat Deborah, he could actually reverse the effects of his spit and save Gohan. This is a relief. Gohan's not actually dead. Well, he won't be if they actually can defeat Deborah. Goten attacked Deborah out of anger, thinking that Gohan was gone for good. But hearing this calms him down a bit and lets him collect himself more and see the bigger picture. Goku is still nervous though, as is everyone else. But Goten is confident that he could take on Deborah alone and save Gohan. He's not one to kill someone, but he's going to make an exception for Deborah. I mean, his occupation is Demon King. Of course, this guy should be taken out. Bobbity is quite intrigued by this fight. Maybe Deborah can draw it out and get some more energy, so he tells the Demon King to do so. He'll provide some help. Goku jumps into the fight too, which means Deborah is now disadvantaged, so he's going to have to fight defensively to save himself and draw it out. Just so no one else can intervene, Bobbity tries to help by teleporting the three of them far away, just so no one else can jump in. Vegeta is tired of Bobbity screwing with everything, so he heads for the ship. Piccolo, Tien, and Yamcha join in as well, with Shin reluctantly following along and warning them to make the fights quick. Things are going very well for Bobbity at the moment. Although he may not gather a lot of energy from the fights in the ship, he got a bunch from Gohan, and now he's getting a bunch from Goten and Goku while they fight Deborah. Vegeta and his group head into the ship and have no trouble with Pui Pui and Yakon, and are now getting closer and closer to Bobbity. Bobbity applauds them for making it through the ship, but they won't get to him anytime soon. He teleports them away from the ship to ensure his safety. Why doesn't he try to possess Vegeta here? Well, for one, he actually doesn't need to right now. He has Deborah gathering energy. But also, Vegeta has had a different course of development in this what if. He progressed to where he is now much earlier in the story, and not to mention, Goku is still alive and they spar and regularly fight. He's more than satisfied right now and has no desire to be possessed in order to fight Goku. So even if Bobbity did try to possess him, it wouldn't work at all. Bobbity actually thinks he's pretty safe right now. Until Shin brings everyone back using the Kai Kai. Yeah, Bobbity's pretty screwed now. The group reaches into his little control room and they easily dispatch of him. Well, that's one issue solved, but they still have Deborah to deal with. Is it too dangerous though? Shin considers the danger, but it's more important to try and stop him right now even if it's dangerous, so he brings the group over to where Deborah is fighting Goten and Goku. They arrive and they see a pretty one-sided fight. Deborah is purely playing defensively right now, not even attacking Goku or Goten, and he's pretty beat up. He's still trying to draw out the battle though, but now, without Bobbity meddling in it, Vegeta is able to jump in and catch Deborah off guard. This leaves an opening for Goten to finish off Deborah now that he's distracted, and he does so. They feel victorious, but still, Shin feels something isn't right. He feels like something bad is going on, something that they wanted to prevent. He brings the group to safety, just in case his thoughts are right, and then he asks half the group to stay back, while he brings Goten, Vegeta, and Piccolo along with him. They teleport back to Bobbity's ship, where Goten meets up with the now freed Gohan, but Gohan seems just as nervous as Shin. They can all sense the same thing, a tremendous evil key. Back near the ship, Buzeg begins to burst with steam, eventually completely breaking open, and the Majin is reborn. Although they stopped Bobbity and Deborah, Deborah was still able to drag the fight long enough to gather energy. Plus, with Gohan showing Kabito his absolute maximum power by even testing Super Kaioken to push to the max, Bobbity got some extra energy from that. Overall, it was just enough to waken Boo. This is exactly what Shin feared, and that's why he took half the group only. Taking the whole group would put everyone at risk. But it seems that Boo isn't instantly hostile. More so, he's confused. He really only wants two things right now. Food or destruction. With no one to order him around right now, he's basically free to do whatever, and is a complete loose cannon. However, he does suddenly become hostile, and then attacks. The group tries to fight back, but they can't do anything right now. Boo fires an attack that, kinda like it did to go on in canon, ends up launching Goten far away from the site of the battle. Gohan tells Shin to retreat with Vegeta and Piccolo, while Gohan is gonna go off and find his brother, while also chasing Boo away. This Boo guy is way too strong right now, and it's best not to fight him. Shin tells him that he plans to head back to the world of Kai's to retreat, and asks Gohan to just come along with him instead, but Gohan declines this. He would rather stay here and find Goten, and he has a plan that requires him to stay on Earth. Once he finds Goten, he's gonna heal him with the Senzu, and maybe if they fuse, they'll be enough to face Boo. They won't even need to retreat. Shin hesitantly accepts this, knowing how strong the fusion possibly could be after Gohan explains it, and the group retreats as Gohan abandons the fight to try and save his brother, 
with Boo chasing him for a bit. Eventually, Boo gets bored and gives up. Boo now is prepared to go on a destructive rampage to ease his boredom, also going on an eating spree. In the meantime, Shin arrives back to where the rest of the group is and fills them out on what happened. Naturally, they could all sense it going down either way, but now they're completely filled in by Shin. To ensure their safety, and in order to get some more preparation for Boo, Shin takes everyone to the Sacred World of Kai's, and plans to have one of them try and free the Z-Sword. Maybe that'll be good training. After much struggle, no one is actually able to free it at first, but eventually, Vegeta steps up after everyone else and is able to brute force it out, now being the one to wield the Z-Sword. Shin decides, since Vegeta freed it, he'll be the one to train with it. The rest of the group consisting of Krillin, Piccolo, Tien, and Yamcha all train on their own, with Goku also being with them but occasionally trying to butt in with Vegeta and train with him, mostly to no avail. With Goku constantly trying to train with Vegeta here, he's just a stress test of the sword too, where he'll throw items at it and Vegeta will try to have to slice them with the sword. Shin thinks this might be a good idea and creates some Kachin to use as target practice. Goku prepares the block and flings it towards Vegeta. Yeah, this doesn't go that well. The sword ends up breaking in two. Shin is completely speechless and Vegeta begins berating Goku, but then they all get distracted when they see that Elder Kai has emerged from the sword. After some exposition, they figure out who he is, learning about who he is and where he came from. And also, Elder Kai learns what's going on here. In order to try and help, Elder Kai reveals his ability to unlock potential, but it'll require the person to sit for a while while he does it. Vegeta's training with the Z-Sword was cut short, and he's too impatient to just sit around waiting for that to happen, and he doubts the ability will even work. Plus, they don't really even have much time. He doesn't want to sit around and waste time while Boo's destroying stuff on Earth. In his eyes, they need to get back to Earth ASAP and they can't wait. Curious though, Goku asks if the ritual can be done on him instead, while Vegeta would just head to Earth and see what's happening. Everyone agrees, and Goku is left to do the ritual, while Shin takes everyone back to Earth, then returns back to the world of Kai's to see what Goku's up to. Back on Earth, things aren't going too well. After hours of searching, Gohan was able to find Goten, and then had to bring him back to the lookout to heal him, after Kami had contacted him and told him to come there. Remember, in this scenario, Kami is still around. He and Piccolo never merged. Since then, he's been waiting there with Kami who allowed Gohan to bring others up there, such as Chi-Chi, Bulma, Trunks, Videl, Eraser, all those others. However, there's one issue here. They don't have any Senzu beans. Goku has them on him at the moment, and they have to wait until his return. Korin doesn't have any lying around either, and his plant isn't going to be ready for a while, so they can't just wait for him to grow it because that's going to take way too long. But for now, at least everyone could just remain here and be safe. They would like to head out now, but Kami is in contact with Shin and advises against it. Shin will be returning soon with the others. Eventually, they all do arrive and explain what happened. Thankfully too, Due to Kami and Shin being in contact, Krillin was able to get the Senzu beans from Goku, since Goku's going to be stuck on the Sacred World of Kai's for a bit. Just in case, this group will join in Gohan and Goten's fight with Buu, and even though Goten might be enough on his own, the group wants to tag along to at least help and be there just in case. Everyone heads off to where they sense Buu. They end up getting close to where they sense him, and they find something kinda odd. As the events have transpired, the whole Buu and Mr. Satan thing happened as well. Mr. Satan may have not been the savior quote unquote of the world due to the Cell games not happening, but he's still regarded as amazing by everyone and attempts to take on Boo himself like normal, which leads to them encountering each other, the house thing happening, their friendship, and the whole thing with B. B was already shot and that caused Boo to get furious. And this is what the group arrives to see. They see evil Boo facing off with Fat Boo, who then eats Fat Boo and turns into Super Boo. The group watches in awe as he transforms into this new powerful beast wondering how they could face him. Suddenly though, Super Buu is able to spot the group and is glad to see that everyone's returned. Goten and Gohan prepare to do the fusion dance, and similar to when they encountered Deborah, immediately, Super Buu launches himself towards the group without them even expecting it. He's ready for a fight right now, and he's not gonna hesitate. He notices the two twins are doing some stupid goofy dance, probably taunting him or something, so they're easy pickings right now while they're distracted. The twins stop their dance midway through and jump out of the way, as Boo flies past and narrowly misses them. Boo turns back around quick and lunges at the twins again. In an effort to try and do some sort of damage, the twins briefly power up to Super Kaioken. Remember, Super Kaioken for these two is very strong, but very strenuous and draining. It's a last resort basically, so that kinda shows the situation that they're in here. They're able to barely block Boo's hits, but not much more. Piccolo and Vegeta try to attack and distract him, which temporarily gets Boo off the twins for a bit. Okay, now it's time to fuse. Boo catches them do the dance again. At first, Boo is under the assumption that they're just taunting him, but why would they be doing the dance again when he's not looking? 
He now realizes it's some weird technique that they're trying out, maybe like how his magic works in some way, but he doesn't know what it's supposed to accomplish. He just attacks them again, making sure to stop it, not wanting to see what it actually does. The two of them actually knew that Boo would attack again, so instantly, they power up to Super Kaioken once more, and launch two quick Kamehamehas that puncture a giant hole through Boo. But Boo isn't damaged, he can just regenerate. Actually, doing this gives Boo an idea. The two giant holes that are blown into him cause pieces of him to fly backwards towards Vegeta and Piccolo, and they don't suspect a thing. This may be a good opportunity to absorb someone, or maybe even both of them. Boo suddenly stops attacking, and just begins laughing maniacally. He turns to Vegeta and Piccolo, and lifts his hand up towards him. Suddenly, the two of them are swarmed by Pink Goo, and are absorbed by the Majin. Boo has now absorbed two strong fighters, and is beginning to transform as Gohan and Goten watch in horror. Vegeta and Piccolo become assimilated with Boo, with Boo gaining the intelligence of Piccolo and the power of Vegeta, as well as Vegeta's appearance. For simplicity, let's call him Boojita. Gohan, Goten, and the rest of the group all watch, and they see Super Boo has suddenly become a lot stronger, wearing the clothes that Vegeta was wearing as well. Even his facial structure changed a bit, and his voice too. Mannerisms and all, this isn't the same Boo that they're fighting anymore. Meanwhile, on the Sacred World of Kai's, Goku is sensing the key signatures on Earth and realizes that something is wrong. He can't stick around for this ritual anymore, and Elder Kai gives him a little gift that might be helpful in case they need some extra power or something. He saves the items for later, knowing that they could definitely be helpful. Before heading out, Goku tries to test out his new power. Even though he ended the ritual early, he's now able to show off this brand new form of his. It's sort of like turning Super Saiyan, but he looks kind of like he's in his base form, although his hair is spiked up differently. Shin now prepares to take Goku to Earth, realizing that the ritual has worked, and Goku might be able to help out. With the birth of Ultimate Goku, we'll leave off here. Gohan and Goten are speechless as they see the Majin's new form standing right before them. His key is way out of their league, and they don't have any other options besides fusing, and they need to do that ASAP. But Boo is doing everything in his power to stop the dance from happening just like before. However, the twins lock out after sensing a new energy appear near them. It feels like... Goku. But it's very different. Bujita senses this as well, and just as quickly as Goku arrives to Earth, he's able to quickly fly over to the battle where Gohan and Goten are. It's Goku alright, but the twins notice something different about their dad. His power is way beyond what it was before, almost as if he was in a form beyond Super Saiyan, but he's not even transformed into Super Saiyan. Well, his hair is spiked up as if he were a Super Saiyan, but his hair and eyes are still black just like his base form. This might be that new form that he got when he was training with Elder Kai. This is a brand new Goku, Ultimate Goku. Let's do a bit of hypothetical power scaling here. So Ultimate Goku had a shorter ritual than Gohan, and I would argue that while Goku does have massive potential, I don't want to underplay that at all, but it's been stated many times that hybrid Saiyans, like Gohan, or even Goten probably, would have more latent potential than a pure Saiyan. So Goku did get a huge boost in power from this, but he's not on the level of Ultimate Gohan from canon. The ritual is shorter, and Goku doesn't have nearly as much potential to unlock as Gohan did. He's only a pure Saiyan after all, not a hybrid. I would argue though that he's definitely above Super Saiyan 3 Goku from canon. Plus, he doesn't have the stamina drain of Super Saiyan 3, so he's already way better off. So he's far above that at least. As for Bujita, well, he's no easy foe either. I would even go so far as to say that Ultimate Goku might be outmatched here. Why is that? Well, with what I said about Goku being below Ultimate Gohan, but stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku, I would argue that he'd be enough to beat Super Buu, and Buu with Piccolo absorbed maybe. But Buu here doesn't just have Piccolo, he has Vegeta, who is a huge factor in Buu's strength here. The easiest comparison is Buu Tanks, who had Gotenks and Piccolo. Obviously Gotenks was way stronger than Vegeta, so Buu here is most likely under the level of Buu Tanks, but still above Super Buu and Super Buu with Piccolo absorbed. And as we saw, Boo Tanks was beyond Ultimate Gohan in terms of power, but since Bujita is a little weaker, who knows? Together, maybe Ultimate Goku and his sons will be enough, and if they're lucky, the twins don't even have to worry about fusing right now. The fight between the three begins, and it's actually pretty close at first. Boo is definitely more advantaged than the three of them, but it still is a 3v1. Goku is able to show off his new power and what it entails, and he's surprised at how strong it is. Unlike Ultimate Gohan when he was facing Buu, this is a little different, because like I said, Ultimate Goku on his own isn't stronger than Buu here. So while Gohan was very cocky against Buu, and Goku usually can become a little bit cocky, this is completely different because Goku's outmatched here, so he's not going to mess up and make mistakes like Gohan did. He has no reason to be cocky. 
The fight rages on with the three members of the Sun family fighting in perfect synergy, as Boo tries to counter everything and he's doing pretty well so far. Even though they're able to put up a good fight, it's not enough. They need to be far stronger than Boo in order to counter his regeneration, and they're not beyond that level yet. Boo doesn't want to draw this out any longer, and then he gets a little bit of an idea. Why not turn this battle into an opportunity for him, something that may work in his favor in the long run. During the fight he suddenly gets a lot more aggressive, and a lot harder to predict and counter. He briefly knocks Goku out of the way and lunges towards the two twin Saiyans, and pummels them into the dirt to get him briefly off his back, effectively stunning them for a bit. He then turns back to Goku, and now it's just the two of them. This is a great opportunity. As Gohan and Goten get back up, they watch as Buu is mercilessly beating Goku. Goku alone can't counter it, and even if he did try to, Buu can just keep regenerating. Just as Gohan and Goten are about to intervene, Goku is beaten badly, while Gohan and Goten are a little injured but far better off. The moment they actually take action, Buu doesn't hesitate or waste any time. He already decided before, it would be a waste for him to kill Goku, because instead, he could just make Goku assimilate with him. Rather than killing Goku and letting all that power go to waste, it's a much better option for Buu to absorb Goku and increase his power instead. Gohan and Goten can't intervene quick enough. Similar to Vegeta and Piccolo, they see a large mass of pink goo surround Goku. With the twins watching, Buu walks up to Goku. Goku fires one last key blast at Buu's face as a distraction, just as he throws something towards Gohan and Goten. This distraction works and Buu doesn't see what he just threw, and just sees it as some feudal resistance. As the pink goo swallows him, Goku gives a thumbs up to his sons, telling them that he's counting on them as he's absorbed by Buu. Gohan and Goten retreat just as soon as Buu begins to transform, seeing no other option besides escaping and trying to think of what they can do now to actually stop this, if anything. With Buu's huge power now, there's no doubt about it that the entire universe is at stake for them. While flying away, they get a chance to actually look down and see what Goku threw at them that they caught. That's really weird, it's a pair of earrings. That gift from Elder Kai that I mentioned, it was a pair of Patara earrings. Elder Kai and Shin have been watching, and they've seen the kids trying to do that fusion technique. That's not really going to cut it here. Elder Kai knows something that's much more convenient, so he decided to give this to Goku just in case. Obviously, the twins don't know what these are supposed to be. All they know is that they look like the things that Shin is wearing on his ears. Are these earrings supposed to do something? They get their answer right after. As Shin begins speaking with them telepathically, he's been watching everything that's happening, and remembers Gohan's plan to fuse. The twins have wanted to fuse into Gotan, but they never had a good opportunity, and now they're on the run and if they stop now to try and fuse, they're just dead. Shin tells them that there's no need to worry. Elder Kai also butts in and explains what these earrings are. They're called Patara, and by having one person wear them on each ear, the two of them can fuse without dancing. However, the effects of this fusion are permanent, or so they think. Although they're potentially more powerful than that silly dance that those two kids do, it's a pretty simple choice, remain fused forever, or let Boo win. The only downside that they can think of is that it'll be kind of weird to explain to their girlfriends, but they'll have to cross that bridge once the Earth is saved. In the distance, coming towards them with immense speed, they see Boo now in Goku's clothing. I guess we can call him Ultimate Buku, or just Buku for short, whatever, and he's coming their way. Without hesitating, the twins stop midair, listening to the Kai's instructions. The two give one last determined grin at each other, and a quick fist bump too. Although they're nervous, this is their only option and it might work. Thanks for everything, Goten. You too, Gohan. These are the last words that they speak to each other, before the two of them suddenly begin to merge, flying towards each other and then being assimilated into one. Buku stops midair, watching at what's happening, confused. What do these two kids just do? A blinding light fills the area, and then, nothing. Buu doesn't see anyone standing before him. Did they use some technique to disappear? Did they turn invisible? Over here. Boo is suddenly startled when he hears a voice behind him, or two voices, and he sees what just happened when he turns around. A new fighter is standing behind him with blonde hair. It looks like Goten. Wait, no, it looks like Gohan. Actually, it kind of looks like both of them. Boo doesn't even have time to process what he's seeing, because just as soon as he sees it, he gets a kick delivered to his face, sending him flying into the ground below. The new fusion slowly descends towards him. Strange. We were expecting the fusion to Goton again. I guess this body deserves a new name in that case. How about... Hanten? This new fusion, named Hanten, stands before Boo. A Patara fusion of Gohan and Goten. Although, this one actually seems to be a bit more powerful than a hypothetical Goton at this point in time. Much like how Goku and Vegeta got a rival boost as Vegito, Gohan and Goten would most likely get something similar here due to their compatibility. 
I mean, they are the perfect match for a fusion, and they've done so before. They're brothers, they're twins, and they're rivals, so they got all three of those going for them. And realistically, any of those factors could probably come in here in terms of a boost, but we only really know of the rival boost, and we don't really know how much it is, but still, it would be safe to assume that they at least get that from this fusion. Now let's call back to my power scaling from before. Well, Bujita was underneath Boo Tanks, and Ultimate Goku is weaker than Ultimate Gohan, so Buku here most likely would be weaker than Buhan, but probably a little bit above Boo Tanks. As for Hanten, well, it's not really a fair match, I'm just gonna say that now. The twins are pretty much around the level that Goku and Vegeta were in canon, in terms of power at least. Plus, they get the same fusion boost, rival boost, and whatever other boost that Vegito gets, and they're in Super Saiyan right now. So imagine this fight like Super Vegito fighting a weaker version of Buhan. And if you go back to look at that fight, Vegito was whooping Buhan with no issues, so this is even easier. Much like Goten, Hanten here is pretty much like a mix of Gotenks and Vegeta, but also a little bit similar to Gotenks in a way in terms of his fighting style. I mean, being the fusion of Goten and Gohan, he's very powerful, very skillful, and also very smart, but he can be a little cocky at times. And also, he does have the style and creativeness that Gotenks had. If you remember way back to the first few parts, I used to mention how the kids used to try and do combo moves and flashy attacks all the time, I mean, being kids and all, and Goten did pretty much the same thing. So, Hanten isn't really any different. Except he's a teenager now, so he's a little bit more mature than that. But who's to say he doesn't want to have a little bit of fun? Hanten is able to completely outpace the Majin, and needs to kill him and not screw around any longer. But, if he kills Boo, then Goku, Vegeta, and Piccolo will be gone for good. Killing Boo means killing Piccolo, and if Piccolo dies, Kami dies as well, meaning that the Dragon Balls go bye-bye. So that's not an option for them. Why, Why don't, don't you wait, wait here for me just a moment? moment. Hanten launches an attack that binds Boo, similar to the Galactic Donut. I mean, this fusion is part Goten after all, who was part Gotenks, so I want to keep a little connection like that. Hanten is taking a gamble, but while Boo is held down, he flies inside of Boo's mouth to see what he could find. He ends up in a strange place, Boo's stomach, and somehow, he's small now. But he's gotta work quick. He fights off the Boo clones inside of the Majin, and is able to find all the people that he was going to save. He frees them and then quickly flies out of Buku, leaving Fat Boo inside of him because he has no real need to save him. Buku then begins regressing. His clothes disappear, his face contorts, and now, he's transforming back into regular Super Boo. The transformation completes and he's appalled. WHAT HAVE YOU DONE?! I don't really remember what Super Boo's voice sounds like, but I'm just gonna stick with that for now. Moving on then, Boo is enraged. He launches an attack at Hanten, who doesn't even block it. Hanten is way out of his league, and the attack pretty much just bounces off him. They want to give Boo a flashy finish, so they decide to use two attacks combined into one. Boo launches towards them, and in that brief moment, they begin to connect their fingers together, almost as if they're making two finger guns pointing at each other, and they charge a blue beam surrounded by a red light around it. They then lift their fingers above their head, and then suddenly, flicking their wrists forward, as if they're pointing those two finger guns at Boo, as the light that they're charging grows larger and larger, their hands fly back with the recoil from the beam, which is launched towards Boo at unfathomable speeds as it continues to grow. It's too fast for Boo to even register, like it completely incinerates Boo before he even realizes that an attack was launched, swirling off into space. The blue beam expands with the spiral continuing to swirl around it, a special beam Kamehameha, a combination of two moves that they learned from Piccolo and Goku as kids when they were training for the Saiyan invasion. I mean, a regular Kamehameha would have sufficed, but they wanted to make it a little bit cooler and more unique. Within a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, the attack completely incinerates Boo, and Fat Boo inside of him as well, leaving nothing left. After launching the attack, trying to look cool, Hanten blows the smoke off his fingers. He's proud of himself for that one. It looks pretty cool, but no one was really watching, so it doesn't really matter. Goku, Vegeta, and Piccolo then regain consciousness after the attack, and stand up to see someone in front of them. Gohan! Wait, it's Goten! Wait, it's Goton! That fusion that they did before! They then explain that it's actually Gohan now, and they fuse with the Patara, and this time, it's permanent. It's not like Goton from before. Piccolo and Vegeta are confused hearing that it's permanent, specious at the fact that these two will be combined forever, with Goku telling his sons, or I guess his son, that he did a great job, but now he's gonna have to deal with a really weird girlfriend situation, as well as Goku having to explain to Chi Chi why they only have one son now instead of two. Hanten actually totally forgot about that, and sheepishly says that at least the Earth is safe, but he's secretly terrified at the thought of having to explain this to everyone. I mean, Goku is as well since he's the one who basically made them fuse and now he has to explain it to Chi Chi. Thankfully for both of them though, he starts to feel funny, and then he diffuses, tossing Gohan and Goten out on the ground beside them. 
Problem solved then, I guess? They all laugh it off. The damage done by Bobbity, Boo, Deborah, etc. It's all restored. And everyone who died during this time was brought back to life. Peace finally resumes on Earth, and now, life can continue back to normal, thanks to Gohan saving the Earth from Boo. Shin and Kabito thank everyone, as well as Elder Kai being there now, and they're very pleased with the performance of these Earthlings. This planet definitely has some interesting characters, and now Earth can finally return back to normal and everyone can go back to their daily lives. It's good to have peace again, but I guess this peace isn't really going to last too long. We do have another antagonist arriving soon, someone of godly proportions, but we're going to save that for the next part and leave off here. So some time passes since the last part, life goes on pretty normally for everyone and very peacefully. Pretty much like usual, Gohan gets married to Videl, and Goten marries Eresa. They have completed high school and now they're moving on with their lives as adults. And as for everyone else, life is going pretty great too. There's no threats on Earth as of now, and things are going very smoothly. But that's all about to change. Far away, Beerus wakes up from his nap after many years of sleeping. He had some premonition about some Super Saiyan God or something like that, and he knows that there's a few Saiyans alive on Earth thanks to Whis, so he decides maybe he should check it out and see if this rumor is true. He and Whis head there, much to the shock of Vegeta who knows all too well who this is. He's pretty terrified but no one else really knows what to be scared about, and Beerus makes himself known and he seems pretty rational right now. They invite him to join in on the festivities, and he has a pretty good time. Fat Boo was never saved in the last part, so he's not here to actually interfere with Beerus by taking the pudding. Beerus gets to taste his pudding and it's pretty delicious. But he doesn't want to delay any further. He's here for a reason, to see the Super Saiyan God that he thought of. No one really knows what he's talking about. I mean, they show off Super Saiyan and even Super Saiyan 2, but they don't know of any Super Saiyan God. He's a little bit disappointed, but he realized that it might have just been a stupid dream and it's not true. However, Whis brings up the fact that this Earth has Dragon Balls and they could probably ask Shenron about it, just to see if it's actually a thing to make sure Beerus is content. Luckily, all the Dragon Balls are on the ship already so they just gather them, and then Shenron is summoned. Overall the rest goes pretty normal, they figure out what the ritual is after trying it out once, but the question is who should they give Super Saiyan God to? Well anyone would really be a good option, and I know you guys would probably want it to be given to someone else, but I feel like the most realistic option is Goku. Goku has been consistently training, and he has Ultimate now, so he's definitely going to be the strongest of the group here. Ultimate alone would put him ahead of everyone by a pretty decent margin, so they decide to give it to the strongest person who would have the best shot at actually pleasing Beerus, and as for the fight itself, it goes pretty much the same so there's not much to cover here. Following the fight, Beerus even offers to train Goku, as well as any of the other Saiyans who want to come. Gohan and Goten are offered it, but they don't really want to, they need to stay here on Earth and focus on their family lives but maybe in the future they would be interested in dropping by and visiting. They also are kind of interested in learning the Super Saiyan God form, but not enough to actually go on a different planet for months on end to learn it. Even Trunks gets offered it, but he wants to stay here and train with Piccolo as well as focus on his schoolwork. You might notice I'm also using a different Trunks design here. That's because he deserves to be aged up. And as the later parts go on, he's going to get older because he was born a few years earlier in this scenario, so you're going to see a new design for him in the later parts. But life proceeds to go pretty normally. Even though they're training with Beerus, Goku occasionally does get to see his family, and even trains with Gohan and Goten for a bit, showing off some of the new powers he learned from Beerus. These multiple interactions with Goku allow Gohan and Goten to eventually get God Key. They're not going to get Super Saiyan God, but they become those godlike Saiyans that Goku and Vegeta were in Resurrection F in their base forms. It's not Super Saiyan God, but it's a start, and they don't know where this power came from because they don't realize how God Key works, but they're not going to question it. It's an inadvertent side effect of Goku visiting his family, requested by Gohan and Goten who want to see how strong he's gotten. And it's good that they got this little power up because now, Frieza's going to be revived, and Frieza's going to come to Earth to get his revenge on those two half Saiyans and Goku and Vegeta. He won't be made into a fool this time. So Resurrection F begins, and the remains of the Dragon Team are there to fight off the Frieza Force, including Trunks now who's been training enough to where he could probably use this as a good practice. Of course he'd have no problem with Frieza Force fodder. Wow, try saying that three times fast. And of course Goten is there too in addition, but anyways, this fight goes pretty easily, they don't have any problems with the Frieza force. But now Frieza himself shows up. He definitely has gotten stronger, but is it going to be enough to take on Gohan and Goten? Well, he doesn't mess around, he powers up right away into his final form, and Gohan and Goten realize how strong he's actually gotten. They both go into Super Saiyan 2, and it's actually enough to hold Frieza off for a bit, and overpower him a little. They do some damage to Frieza and wear him out a little bit, and Frieza's pretty impressed with how strong they are, but he has something else up his sleeve. 
his new golden form, which he proceeds to show off in all its glory. Okay, yeah, this might be a problem. They're still waiting for Goku and Vegeta to get contacted so they can come back to Earth, and they need to come up with some different strategy to actually hold Frieza off for now. It would be great if they had the Batara earrings and could fuse right away, but they sadly don't have access to them right now. But even without Batara, they still can use their other method of fusion, the fusion dance, which they haven't used in a while. They can't create Hanten, but they could bring Gotan back. They appeal to Frieza's ego and tell him that if he wants a real challenge, that he should allow them to do this technique that they have. They don't tell him what it is, but they promise him that it'll be worth his time. Frieza thinks that no technique they could use could actually overpower him, so he allows them to do it as one last shot of saving their planet. He decides to throw them a bone before they die. And that was a pretty big mistake. They proceed to do the dance, and Frieza watches in awe as they fuse into one person. He's actually just kinda confused. Why did they turn into one fighter and what will that do for them? Is this just them added together, or is this someone else completely different altogether? The light dissipates, and the fusion is revealed. It's, it's been, been a while since we've been, been in this body, but we're still glad to be back. Gotan introduces himself to Frieza, as a new warrior that isn't Gohan or Goten, but two of them combine into one, someone much stronger than either of them combined. Frieza doesn't buy it, and he actually sees this as a handicap. It's one person instead of two. There's no way he'd actually be stronger than both of them combined. This is great, his guard is down, so he's not going to expect what's coming next. Especially after the last time Gotan appeared as a kid, he doesn't want to screw around here and get too cocky. And he knows the fusion has a time limit, so he doesn't want to waste any time. While Frieza's guard is down, Gotan appears behind him and kicks him into the ground. He then races towards the ground before Frieza can get there, and kicks him back up, basically playing a game of catch with himself. Frieza let his guard down and now he's paying the price for it. He's flung back and forth by Gotan, who's going all over the place. Not going Super Saiyan in order to make the fusion last longer. Frieza does attempt to fight back, but him and base Gotan are actually somewhat evenly matched. Considering the fact that Frieza has took some damage beforehand and he lost a bit of stamina, not to mention this is a god key fusion, and I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that it's going to be a little bit below where Blue Goku is. We know that fusion is a massive multiplier. The fight goes on for a little bit longer, but Gotan decides he needs to finish it now. Without Frieza even noticing, Gotan goes Super Saiyan and fires a Kamehameha at him. Frieza blocks the blast, but when the smoke dissipates, Frieza looks around and sees something that terrifies him. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of different pieces of energy are around him as Gotan keeps flinging blasts near Frieza. What could this even be? The blasts start circling around Frieza, and eventually, they go in towards him. The Kamehameha was a distraction, but this is the main course. A super-powered Hell Zone grenade. The blasts hit Frieza and kill him, as Gotan continues throwing more and more key blasts towards it, even briefly powering up into Super Saiyan 2 while doing it. Super Saiyan 2, Gohan, and Goten weren't enough to take on Golden Frieza, they weren't even close. But Gotan was actually a pretty good match, and outpowers Frieza once he goes into Super Saiyan 2. The Earth is saved and Resurrection F is over, and now we get into the Universe 6 tournament. Shampa shows up like normal, and then the tournament is planned. And now Universe 7 needs to make a team. Beerus doesn't recruit Minaka this time, because Vegeta's constantly trying to get ahead of Goku, while Goku's trying to maintain his lead, so he's already motivated enough to be the strongest, and actually catch up to Beerus' arrival. Plus, they already unlocked some new form, Super Saiyan Blue, which they weren't able to show off yet. So their train is going pretty smoothly. But now they need to make a team for this tournament. So Goku and Vegeta are obvious picks. And they go to Earth, and they recruit three members. Gohan, Goten, and Piccolo. The weird thing here is that Gohan and Goten accept, even though they're working. And Piccolo's actually the one to decline. He'd love to be in the tournament. But he reminds Vegeta that Trunks has been training with him. And doesn't he want to see how well his son would perform here? Vegeta has been training Trunks, but ever since he headed to Beerus' planet, Trunks needed to find some new way to train, so he asked Piccolo, as well as Gohan and Goten, with Piccolo mainly being the one training him and teaching him new stuff. Vegeta actually agrees. He does want to see the progress his son's made, especially now that he's getting older and he's going to be fighting more. Gohan and Goten are also curious to see Trunks in action, since they have that relationship with Trunks where he's kind of like a younger sibling to them, so they want to see how he's progressing. Goku has no objections either, so Trunks actually ends up taking the place of Piccolo here. He needs some real world experience, so Piccolo decides this is for the best. As well as Vegeta, who hasn't seen his son fight in a while. So the tournament begins, and the first person up is Trunks vs. Batamo. Trunks actually does pretty well here. At first, he's not able to defeat Batamo, and he doesn't know what he's gonna do. But since punching him won't work, he's gonna try to think of some other strategy in order to work around it. You know, Batamo seems pretty stretchy, and that includes his legs and arms too. Trunks has a plan that might work. He suddenly lunges towards Batamo grabbing one of his arms and pulling it. 
but Tama doesn't know what Trunks is trying to do, until Trunks grabs his other arm and proceeds to tie them together. But Tamo's arms are now tied up, meaning he can't punch back. Trunks realizes that this means that Batamo can only use his legs now, and Batamo goes in to kick Trunks, which works right into his plan. Trunks grabs into Batamo's leg when he kicks him, and then proceeds to tie that leg into the other one. He's actually pretty surprised with how stretchy Batamo is, but it doesn't matter now. Batamo's all tied up, and Trunks just picks him up and flings him out of the ring. Vegeta laughs at this and is pretty impressed. This is something he would do, like we saw in the Tournament of Power, and he commends his son for thinking outside the box. He's feeling pretty proud right now. But Batamo wasn't particularly that strong, it was just his ability that made him a formidable foe. Trunks' next foe is actually more of a challenge. He's up against someone who looks exactly like Frieza, it's Frost. It's weird because this guy actually seems kind of different from Frieza. He doesn't seem as evil, I mean he is from a different universe after all so that doesn't mean he's going to be exactly like Frieza. But he's the same race as Frieza it looks like so he probably had some transformations up his sleeve. After seeing what happened with Frieza during Resurrection F, Trunks doesn't even want to risk having Frost transform if he could even do that. And the only way to counter Frost right now is to go full power right away and take him out. He's a little nervous thinking that this guy might actually be on a similar level of power as Frieza, especially if he decides to transform, but Trunks goes for it anyways, instantly powering up in Super Saiyan 2 and lunging towards Frost. With a single blow, he flings Frost out of the ring, but he feels a little scratch on his arm. Trunks then falls to the ground due to the poison that Frost injected in him. While Trunks got a ring out on Frost, Frost actually knocked Trunks unconscious, so it's a double KO. They don't know it's because of the poison either, they think it's just some ability that Frost has. So the tournament continues. Vegeta's impressed with Trunks' thinking, as is Piccolo and Gohan and Goten. It seems he's developing into a good warrior, and he has potential to get even stronger. Goten congratulates Trunks, as he heads out into the ring next to face Megeta. Goten tries to fight the giant robot man, delivering a powerful punch to Megeta, only to yank his hand back in pain from punching the metal. He then tries some Ki Blast too, because punching him won't actually work, and it seems like that's not working. Goten makes a harmless remark to himself about how powerful this guy is, and how freakishly durable this is, given how sensitive Megeta is. He shows a bit of a reaction to Goten calling him freakish, even if it was an indirect way of commenting on that. That wasn't even really an insult and Megeta took offense to it, so Goten thinks he might actually have a weakness to insults. Goten apologizes in advance, not wanting to be mean, but he decides to throw some insults towards Megeta. Needless to say, Megeta can't take them that well, and he jumps out of the ring not wanting to fight anymore, feeling offended. Goten apologizes once more, but it's a way of winning, so he doesn't question it. Although he does kind of feel bad about making fun of Megeta, who seems like a nice guy. Next is Kaba, and Goten is up against him, and he's interested to see that this guy is a Saiyan. He asks Kaba if he could turn into a Super Saiyan, and Kaba doesn't know what that is, so Goten transforms and shows it off himself. Kaba's pretty interested in this form, but he doesn't know how he could actually access it, and Goten doesn't really know how to teach him it. It took him a while of training and also different emotions to actually access the form, so he tells Kaba it's a long process, not knowing that he could teach it the way that Vegeta did. But Kaba seems nice, so Goten wants to make it fair, and he powers back down to base and fights him that way. Kaba's actually pretty powerful even in base, and it's a somewhat friendly fight actually. Kaba isn't fighting as seriously as he did against Vegeta, and Goten is also taking it pretty lightly, and Goten is able to get the win because of this. He promises Kaba that if they ever cross paths again, he'll teach him how to do Super Saiyan, and Gohan might even help him as well. But he tells Kaba to keep it in mind and see if he could access it somehow on his own. Finally, Hit is up, and needless to say, Goten isn't any match for him. Goten goes into Super Saiyan 2, but it's not even enough to counter hit. After Goten, Goku goes up. And I'll spare you the details because the fight doesn't really go that different, but the fight goes pretty much the same as it did normally. Goku may not have Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken here, but he's actually a little bit stronger, so it's making the fight not as different as it was in canon. He takes the fall, and next, Gohan is up against Hit. Nervous about how this fight will go, he decides to power up to his full power right away, and use something that he hasn't used in a while. Although it is draining, he stacks Kaioken on top of Super Saiyan once again, which he only ever did a few times before in desperate situations. At best, Super Kaioken isn't really going to last too long, maybe a minute. So he decides to see what it could do against Hit, if anything. He launches towards Hit, and Hit flies out of the ring. Everyone's just confused, especially Gohan. There's no way that was powerful enough to take on a Hit. And it wasn't, not even really close. Looks like Gohan didn't even need to worry about anything after all, because Hit just took the fall anyways because Goku did. And that concludes the Tournament of Destroyers. And now we move on to the future Trunks arc. And though I normally don't have this villain appear in my what ifs, this time there's a good reason for it. There's no Gohan Black, there's no Vegeta Black, there's no Goten Black. This time, we're going with the man himself, 
Goku Black. But we'll have to wait until the next part for Goku Black to actually show up. And this is where we'll leave off for now. It's a pretty peaceful day at Capsule Corp. Nothing's really happening, until out of nowhere, Trunks shows up in his time machine. Unbeknownst to everyone in the main timeline, something has happened in Trunks' future that has completely changed it. Once again, he faces an apocalyptic threat. But this time it's someone or something that's far worse than the androids. The beginning of this arc goes pretty similar to normal. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Goten show up to Capsule Court to meet Trunks, and they hear about what's happening. Someone that looks like Goku has been attacking his timeline, destroying everything and everyone. And speak of the devil, because Goku Black then appears through a time portal. We begin to see a little bit of change here, as Goku faces off against his imposter. His strength is pretty impressive. Even in base, Goku Black is pretty powerful. So Goku decides to turn up the pressure, past Super Saiyan and past Super Saiyan 2. He actually goes into ultimate. He knows how prevalent of a threat Goku Black is, and going ultimate should be enough to defeat him. Goku Black gets pretty badly beat up, and knows that he has to retreat. There's no way he could win this. But before he does, he leaves a little parting gift, by destroying Trunks' time machine. He then retreats into a portal, bringing him back to his timeline. Goku was able to get some pretty good hits in and nearly defeat him, but Goku Black was smart enough to escape, knowing that he couldn't win this. And now they're stuck with a broken time machine, while Goku Black's in the future doing god knows what. Thankfully, they can at least have Bulma repair and probably even modify the time machine. But that will take some time, so Trunks is stuck here for the time being. While that's going on though, Trunks is able to spend some time with Gohan and Goten, as well as Vegeta. He gets some brief training time in with Goku and even Vegeta, as well as catching up with Gohan and Goten. The last time he saw these two, they were pretty young. He obviously knows what Gohan's like when he's an adult, but he doesn't know about Goten, because there was no Goten in his timeline. But it's interesting to him to see how these two have developed, both as people and as fighters. They definitely have gotten way stronger. Of course, during this time too, Beerus and we suspect that Zamasu has something to do with this, so they go off to see him, as well as Goku being summoned to see Zeno. With Goku absent, Vegeta and Trunks head off into the future with Gohan and Goten. Present Trunks wants to come along too, but he's told to stay back from this one because it's kinda out of his league. Understandably, they don't want him getting hurt. We saw in the last part how Trunks is a lot more motivated to train here, so naturally he also would want to help out with something like this. He understands why he can't go, but he really did want to try and help out, wanting to prove himself in his newfound strength. But don't worry, we'll see some of that towards the end of this part. But now, let's follow Vegeta and his crew into the future. And pretty similar to Vegeta's first encounter with Goku Black, the events here play out somewhat the same. Goku Black is facing more people. There's Gohan and Goten there. But Goku Black is actually a little bit stronger this time after his beatdown from Ultimate Goku. In his Rosé form especially, I feel like he'd be able to hold him off somewhat well, especially since Zamasu reveals himself too. They find out who Zamasu is and what they're planning, as well as the fact that this guy is immortal somehow. Okay, that's a big issue. How are they supposed to kill someone who's immortal? The answer is, you really can't, so they're kinda screwed here for now. They get a little bit beat up, but they're able to retreat, and now they have to think of some way to actually defeat this Zamasu guy. Of course, they report to Beerus and Whis, who then find out that Zamasu is actually the one behind this, so they go to Universe 10 again and catch him in the act of trying to kill Goasu, and they dispose of him. Okay, well, this one wasn't immortal, so they have to try and figure out a way to defeat the immortal one, as well as Goku Black. They have to wait for the time machine to refuel, so in the meantime they could try and come up with some ideas. Gohan and Goten have one specific idea that they want to try out, so alongside Goku and Vegeta, they try that out. You'll see what I'm referring to later. But this idea might actually help a bit. Besides that, Piccolo hears of this and suggests that they try to learn the Mafuba, kind of like they used against him and his father. He saw firsthand how it worked pretty well against Kami, so he knows it might actually work against Zamasu here. I mean, it doesn't kill him, but it could at least contain him. This is actually a really great idea, and Goku takes Gohan and Goten to Roshi to see if they can all learn it together, while Vegeta decides he's gonna go train some more. He drags Trunks into the room of spirit and time with him, and also, present Trunks joins as well because why not? This seems like a pretty cool way for him to train, especially since he could be training with his future self. A few days go by, and eventually, Goku, Gohan, and Goten all learn the technique from Master Roshi. They decide three people's better than one learning it, just in case. And this means they're more prepared and they don't forget the seal this time. Vegeta, Trunks, and, um, Trunks all exit the Room of Spirit in time. Vegeta knows that Zamasu's immortal, but Goku Black doesn't seem to be the same. So he saw training as a good idea because while it might not work for Zamasu, Brute Force would definitely work against Goku Black. And now, they seem like they're prepared to head into the future. One thing I want to point out here again about Trunks 
In terms of his physical body, he would be about 16 years old, so once we get to age 780, you're gonna see an age up from him. You'll see that at the end of the video. Future Trunks looks like this at 17, so I'm sure this Trunks would age up as well. So stick around to the end. With their new training in mind, and the seal as well as the container, they travel back into the future ready to face Zamasu and Goku Black. They actually have a nice little strategy here. Zamasu alone didn't actually seem that strong, so Gohan and Goten think they could take him on alone. They're both prepared with the new technique that they learned, so they should be fine. As for Goku, Vegeta, and Trunks, they're all going to face Goku Black. The three of them together should be more than enough to overpower Goku Black. So first, let's follow Gohan and Goten in their fight against Zamasu. Together, they're both only in Super Saiyan 2, but you gotta remember, as I mentioned in the last episode, they have God Ki within them, so they're already God-like Saiyans. Of course, they don't have Super Saiyan God or Blue yet, but they're massively powerful on their own. Not to mention they have perfect synergy when they fight, and they're pretty much the perfect duo. They're more than enough to hold off Zamasu together. They begin fighting Zamasu, and the Kai is confused on what they're trying. Do they really think they could defeat him? They know he's immortal, so what do they think they're up to? During this fight, the two of them eventually split up. Gohan takes on the evil Kai alone, while Goten prepares the Mafuba. Gohan's able to serve as a great distraction, he's able to take on Zamasu alone, and once he sees Goten's ready, he's able to jump out of the way and grab the container. Zamasu's confused as to what's going on, and then eventually, he gets caught up in a wave of energy, as Goten lifts him up into the air, and then slams him back down into the ground, leading into the container. Gohan puts the lid on and seals it, making sure that Zamasu won't escape. They make sure it's sealed correctly, and they know for sure that they've defeated Zamasu. He's contained, and now he can't do anything, so their only issue right now is Goku Black. They head over to join Goku, Vegeta, and Trunks in their fight. Goku Black is a pretty tough opponent, but they're still able to hold their own relatively well and actually somewhat outpace him. And now, it's time to break out that technique that they learned from Gohan and Goten. With a solar flare, Trunks is able to act as a distraction for Goku Black. Black's vision returns, and then he sees Trunks standing there with some new fighter. Goku and Vegeta are gone, but now there's this new guy that looks kind of like both of them together. Oh no. Did they do Patara Fusion? Nope, actually the opposite. They did the Fusion Dance. Remember I mentioned they learned that technique from Gohan and Goten? Well, yep, that was the Fusion Dance. Knowing how quickly Goku Black can grow, and all the weird techniques he has, they know they can't risk drawing this out any longer. Gogeta's probably a little bit overkill, but better safe than sorry, am I right? From what little we've seen, even base Gogeta is stronger than blue Goku and Vegeta. But just for assurance, he would probably power up to Super Saiyan, just to make sure Goku Black has no chance at escaping. That would be playing it a little too safe at that point. But they are able to defeat Goku Black. And now, that means the future's actually saved. Trunks' timeline doesn't get erased, and everyone's perfectly okay. Goku and Vegeta kinda wish they learned this fusion dance sooner. It's a pretty good technique that'll definitely come in handy in the future, and they see why Gohan and Goten used it so much. Plus, they came up with a cool name for it, Gogeta, so they already kinda take a liking to it. Trunks takes everyone home on one last trip, thanking everyone for their help. The container with Zamasu is given to Whis, and he'll try to hide it somewhere or do something with it. They need to make sure this is far away and safe, and no one can access it, so he'll do something about it. This was kind of a nice experience for Trunks because he got to see everyone again, and they helped him out. He was especially happy to see his past self and even get to train with him a bit. It was a pretty unique experience. I mean, it is weird for him to see Gohan, his former master there, but it's even weirder for him to see his past self. And having that opportunity to train with him in the Room of Spirit and Time was actually pretty great. He has high hopes for this timeline and was glad that he could rely on them. He says his goodbye and then heads back to his timeline, and that's the end of this arc. Good thing Goku didn't have to resort to the Zeno button. So what now? About a year passes and things go pretty similar. Life thankfully returns to normal on Earth for a bit, while Goku and Vegeta are off training with Beerus. Well, that is until Vegeta knows that he has another kid on the way. Pretty much like usual, Goku would probably remember about that tournament that Zeno mentioned and would want to check in with him, setting in motion the Tournament of Power. First, they have the Zen Exhibition match, which doesn't go too differently, except Boo is replaced here by Goten. There's no need to go in depth here. I'm sure the three fighters from Universe 7 would be able to hold their own, and it wouldn't go too differently. But now, they're tasked with recruiting some other people. Vegeta seemed like a tough sell, but they're able to get him a joint eventually once Whis helps Bulma give birth to Bola. So along with Gohan and Goten, they now have four people. Of course, Piccolo is a great option too. So now they need five more. Who will they pick? Vegeta has one good pick, and he decides to go get him. Vegeta comes back with his new candidate, and Goku's actually pretty shocked to see him because he looks completely different now. Trunks is the next member on their team, ready to finally show off his strength once again. Vegeta, of course, would want his son here, as would Piccolo being his teacher somewhat. 
and of course Gohan and Goten would be glad to have him on the team. As for the rest of the team, they have some pretty simple options. Krillin and 18 would still be some great team members as well, so they also end up joining. They actually don't see any need to recruit 17 here, because they actually do have another member that'll be helpful. Besides recruiting Tenshinhan like normal, Yamcha also gets to join the team. I haven't mentioned him for a few parts, but if you remember from a few parts ago, I did mention that he was actually more motivated to train and has actually been keeping up with it. And here he'd probably be a better option than Roshi for a team member. So they get him to join and they don't even need to consider 17 as an option, because they already have 10 people. And of course, no Frieza either. So overall, the team has a lot of the same members, except Frieza, 17, and Roshi are replaced by Goten, Trunks, and Yamcha. Gohan and Goten also don't want to rely on fusion here, and make sure to tell Goku and Vegeta the same. If they do fuse, that will make a stronger warrior, but then that means they're going to have one less person on the team. And if they get knocked out, that means they get two people knocked out at once. It's a double-edged sword, so they don't want to use fusion and would rather get stronger on their own. They do still have God Ki within them, and that gets Goku and Vegeta wondering. They still do have a day and they could use the Room of Spirit in time, so they wonder if they can get Gohan and Goten to access at least Super Saiyan God before the tournament starts. It would be a huge help if they had that form, as it's way stronger than Super Saiyan 2, which is what they're currently at. They're already pretty strong as is, and Super Saiyan God would really ensure Universe 7's victory. In order to ensure that they'll be able to unlock this form, and potentially even Super Saiyan Blue above that, Goku's gonna head in with both of them, bringing extra food to account for the extra person in there. And Goku actually leaves midway through, thinking that they have it handled, and also wanting to see how everyone else is performing. It's been a little bit of time since he's seen some of the people on his team, so he kind of wants to spar with them and see where they are in terms of power. After the day passes, Gohan and Goten come back into the real world. Just in their base, they seem way stronger than before. But according to the poll you guys voted in, you said you wanted to see them access Super Saiyan Blue, not just God. This comes as a shock to everyone. Of course, they were expected to get God at the very least, but now they also have Blue, which will be a huge help. So the training definitely did pay off. Trunks is amazed to see his two friends like this, and he hopes that he can attain this power one day. Super Saiyan 2 is good enough for him right now, and he's very strong on his own, but it does get him thinking. This may be something he should keep his eye on in the future. Given their hybrid potential, I would also say that Gohan and Goten have surpassed Goku by this point. Goku also did get a lot stronger because he was in there a couple months, but he left partway through, and like we saw with Gohan in the main story, we could see how fast hybrid Saiyans progress. So I'd actually say they're the strongest on the team, and they're about even with each other. And this is great all around because the team is stronger as a whole, which will definitely help in the tournament. Thankfully, they stopped their training at just the right time, because not long after, everyone heads off to the World of Void. The Tournament of Power is about to begin. The group has a similar strategy this time. Gohan and Goten want people to stick together, but that's not really going to fly with Goku and Vegeta. At least for the other people on the team, they might try and heed this warning. All these universes seem exceptionally powerful, so it's important that they work strategically, and thus, the tournament begins. As expected, Gohan and Goten end up sticking together. After their Room of Spirit and Time training, they know their strengths and have decided not to use fusion because that means one less fighter, just like they warned Goku and Vegeta about earlier on. I mean, it would be cool for a Goten and Gogeta tag team, but maybe that's something for the future, that's not gonna happen right now. Their focus here working together as individuals, and there will be some distance between them, but they'll remain relatively close creating a powerful duo that most other fighters can't contend with. Like normal, Goku and Vegeta head off individually, and as for Trunks, he sticks with Piccolo. I mean, Vegeta kinda wants to do his own thing, and Piccolo is Trunks' teacher, so they seem like a good duo. Krillin and 18 try this out as well and stick together, as do Tien and Yamcha. Within a matter of minutes, people start getting eliminated, and eventually, the first universes begin getting erased. Zeno was not bluffing, and this only makes everyone more serious during the tournament and more motivated to win. Trunks and Piccolo are doing pretty well together on their own. They're fighting together and Piccolo's amazed at how strong Trunks has gotten. He's knocking people out pretty casually and he's doing well overall. Like I said, even without Super Saiyan God or Blue, Trunks is still really strong in Super Saiyan 2. And it's good that he's strong because now they're about to face an actual challenge. Frost has come back for his revenge against Trunks after being made a fool in the Universe 6 tournament. Although Trunks looks much different from before because he aged, Frost can still easily tell it's the same guy. Frost is immediately in his final form, and he begins fighting Trunks. And Trunks actually does face some trouble against him, but Piccolo joins in quickly to help. Frost greatly underestimates them, and the two are able to work together with powerful combos to take him out. The two of them end with a flashy finish. Piccolo fires a Masenko while Trunks fires a Gallic Gun, swirling together into what they call a Gallic Masenko, I guess. And Frost is knocked out, through a mix of pure power and strategy. 
This only angers Frost even more, and he lashes out by trying to attack them from the stands, which leads to him getting erased. Let's actually move over to the Universe 6 Saiyans for a bit. They're really at a huge disadvantage. Kaba was able to recruit the same people, Kale and Kalifla, and he told them about something called Super Saiyan that he heard about. They tried working for it, but they never were actually able to get it. Goten never was able to teach Super Saiyan to Kaba in this timeline, because he is the one who fought Kaba in the tournament. They're much weaker than normal. Things are not really looking too well for Universe 6. They just lost one of their strongest fighters, and their team is weaker overall, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. Also, with no Frost, I guess that means Krillin gets to stay in, so yay for him. And it seems the strategy of working in duos is going pretty well. Because on the other side of the tournament, Tien and Yamcha are facing challenges of their own. Eventually, it leads to Tien dropping off the ring like normal, but he actually gets saved by something this time. While his clones are falling, one of them eventually gets picked up by something. It almost feels like he got a powerful punch at the stomach. He's lifted back up and flops onto the ring, and he looks up to see Yamcha there with his fingers out, piloting a spirit ball that just knocked Tien back into the ring. Even though it did kinda hurt Tien, it was a good way to bring him back, and the two of them now have to prepare for things to heat up further while Tien tries to regather his energy. Moving on, Goku does try to face Jiren pretty much like normal. Not even Super Saiyan Blue is enough to fight him. I feel like this still would happen because it's just in Goku's nature to try and fight this while everyone else would just want to avoid Jiren. So, this encounter still probably would happen. It goes pretty much like normal though, except there's no Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken. Well, at least not for Goku. Spoiler alert. Even without the Spirit Bomb, I still feel like Goku would find a catalyst to activate Ultra Instinct. So even if he doesn't have that here, and also if he doesn't have Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken, I feel like that won't really make a difference. Because either way, he's getting his ass beat. Pretty much like normal. Following this great spectacle, Gohan and Goten are actually able to eliminate a few people after they begin fighting again. Feeling comfortable fighting on their own, they split up briefly and decide to regroup later. And this is where Goten actually encounters Kaba again. Kaba is beaten up, but he's still ready to fight. And then he recognizes that it's Goten, so he drops his guard a bit. Luckily for him, Goten's not here to fight Kaba. It's actually good that he ran into him. From what Goten can gather, pretty much everyone in Universe 6 has gotten eliminated. Kale and Cauliflower weren't able to keep up, and Hit got eliminated by Jiren like normal. Saunel and Piranha are the only other ones in, besides Kaba who's still hanging in there. Goten obviously doesn't feel right about knocking Kaba out, especially in the cities in now, so he tries to teach him Super Saiyan like he promised. He feels kinda bad that he didn't teach it before, because now his universe is gonna be erased. Given the stress that Kaba's under right now, it seems like he might actually be able to go Super Saiyan, it won't be too hard of a task, so Goten tries his best to get him to imagine what the feeling of Super Saiyan is like. Unlike how Kaba got it against Vegeta because of a threat, he actually is able to unlock it here because he is facing some real stress right now, his whole universe is at stake. It seems reasonable that with all this on his mind, he would be able to get it somehow, and he is able to briefly hold it. Goten's happy to see this, but Kaba still seems somewhat defeated. He powers back down into base and seems somewhat relaxed. He's glad that he got Super Saiyan, but now that he's tried it, he realizes that even it won't be enough to save his universe. He appreciates the gesture from Goten though. Knowing he's going to be knocked out anyways, he wants Goten to do the honors, wanting to fight in his brand new form. Goten's very hesitant to do this because Kaba's kind of his friend, and he can doubt it all he wants but he knows that Kaba won't be able to make it here. It seems pretty much hopeless for Universe 6, so he might as well give Kaba his last wish. Goten fights him in base and he's pretty impressed with Kaba. It's weird because he never expected to be teaching someone like this. Kaba knows Goten can go to even higher levels, and he tells Goten not to hold back. He transforms into Super Saiyan Blue, showing it off to the young Saiyan. Kaba's amazed, and he wishes that he could have gotten something like this, but it seems like that's not going to be the case for him because his universe is going to be erased. Goten goes up to Kaba, and he makes him a promise. Goten's going to win the tournament and get the wish. Not only reviving Universe 6, but every other universe that gets erased. This makes Kaba happy and gives him some sort of comfort, and he thanks Goten for all that he's done. Goten says his goodbye, and he knocks Kaba off the ring. Luckily, that encounter ended just in time, because Gohan's having some trouble with the universe too. He was fighting Rebrian and eliminated her, but now the rest of universe 2 is coming after him, so Goten joins in to help. They're having a bit of trouble, and decide to break out something secret that they thought of, but didn't know if it would actually work. The two of them are in blue right now, and they decide to stack another technique on top of it, Kaioken. They haven't used it in a while, and they don't know if it'll work with Super Saiyan Blue, but it's worth a shot. Basically, all of Universe 2 is coming for them right now, so they might as well try this. Briefly, they flash into Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken times 4, and make quick work of everyone in Universe 2, although it was a pretty draining technique to use. It's a good thing they only use it for a few seconds, because otherwise it would have hurt them badly. Goku and Vegeta sense this and are surprised that they access something above Blue, but they have something up their sleeves as well. 
Those kids might have their fancy Kaioken technique with Super Saiyan Blue, but Goku and Vegeta have something that arguably might be even better. Well, at least for them, that is. We'll see that a little bit later. Trunks and Piccolo right now are facing Sound Owl and Pirina. The Namekians from Universe 6. These Namekians are really strong, and unlike Frost, they're not cocky at all. They're a great match in power for those two, and together their power might even eclipse Piccolo and Trunks. With all their might, they're about to knock Piccolo and Trunks out, until Perina gets kicked out of the ring from behind. Sanel's confused and looks over, and this gives Piccolo and Trunks the opportunity to knock him out. A fighter lands next to them and they don't really recognize who it is, but then it clicks with Piccolo. He's seen this person before, and recognizes who it is. It's Tiencha. Tien and Yamcha know that Gohan and Goten didn't want anyone fusing, but they decided to bring Tiencha back as they feel he'll be more helpful than both of them individually. They're able to hang in the tournament for a while, but it seems they might be getting a little bit out of their league, so fusing ends up being their best option. Tiencha has both the techniques of Tien and Yamcha, and he's very powerful, but one of his best aspects is his vision, which comes in handy because just about then, Universe 4 has two fighters that knock out Krillin in 18. Using his three eyes, Tiencha's vision allows him to find the Universe 4 fighters and eliminate them single-handedly, but it's too bad he wasn't able to catch them earlier and save Krillin in 18. Those two are actually the first eliminations on the team, so Universe 7 has a really good lead right now, and that's what causes Universe 3 to bring out their last resort, Aniraza. But he's defeated pretty easily. I mean, you have six fighters and then Fusion working together to take him out. So it's not really too hard with brute force. The group split up once again, and that pits Gohan and Goten against Dispo, while Tiencha, Piccolo, and Trunks face Topo, and Goku and Vegeta face Jiren. Working together in Super Saiyan Blue, Gohan and Goten are actually able to defeat Dispo without using some cage like Frieza did. Briefly activating Kaioken allows them to speed up really fast, so they were actually to keep up with Dispo by using it very conservatively. This seems to be really helpful for them, because they could briefly activate it when they attack, so they won't have to worry about it draining stamina while they're fighting. And it's good that they took out Dispo so quickly, because they're able to join Piccolo, Tiencha, and Trunks in fighting Topo. Meanwhile, Goku and Vegeta are facing Jiren. They don't have Kaioken right now, but they do have way more experience with Super Saiyan and Blue, and like I teased before, they do have a new step above it. They suddenly stop fighting when facing Jiren, and start calming down as their aura begins going into their body. This is a new stage of Super Saiyan Blue that they've accessed, perfected Super Saiyan Blue. While it does take some focus to maintain, it allows them to use the form at 100% power, without any of it being radiated away like normal. In this new perfected Super Saiyan Blue, they're able to use it against Jiren, but it doesn't really do too much to him. They were barely even able to get a couple hits on him, and those hits didn't even do anything. Things aren't looking good, because there's seemingly no way to take him down. After everyone gangs up on Topo, they decide to join Goku and Vegeta against Jiren because there's no one else left. It really has just come down to Jiren versus everyone from Universe 7. Well, besides Krillin and 18. So what are they supposed to do? So they're just gonna have to rely on what they actually have. They're gonna have to work together somehow and use strategy instead of power. And this is where Tiencha comes in and helps a bit. He's gonna rely on some abilities to support the team. So he distracts Jiren by launching a massive solar flare blinding him and giving everyone time to get into position while they lower their key. They lunge at him with quick attacks, and Jiren is able to fend them off. Jiren thinks they're foolish to try this because it won't work. Even if he's blinded, it will still be fine for him. He starts facing some struggle because there's so many people moving so fast around him, so he can't block all of them, but even when he does get hit, it doesn't hurt too much. His vision eventually comes back, and he's angry now. But then he sees there's multiple Tianchas around him. He split himself into four people and he's surrounding Jiren, providing support with unexpected solar flares. Jiren averts his gaze from one of them, but then is met by another Tiencha, who does another solar flare in his face. Jiren is getting angry by all this, and while blinded, he starts showing off some of his power. Inadvertently, he knocks Piccolo off, hitting the Tiencha clones as well. They just lost two fighters, and this is looking bad. Goku's trying to focus his mind right now, seeing if he can access Ultra Instinct. He wasn't so sure before, but maybe he'll be able to briefly tap into it somehow. Everyone else fights Jiren and lets Goku do his thing. Somewhat like what happened in the manga, Goku is able to awaken UI again briefly, but very briefly after focusing his mind. But he does seem a little bit stronger than before. This is a welcome surprise to everyone because they see Goku now fighting Jiren, and he's actually able to get some hits in. But they can tell UI is wearing off and it's fleeting from him fast. As energy radiates off Goku, Gohan and Goten try to distract Jiren for now and join in, and tell Goku to get out of the battle before he uses too much of his stamina. Almost as if he was holding his breath, Goku lets go of Ultra Instinct and goes back to normal, tired out but not completely out of the fight. 
while Gohan and Goten try and face Jiren, Trunks calls Goku and Vegeta over. They keep their distance providing support, but then Trunks has an idea for them. Goku's pretty worn out now and he probably won't be able to access Ultra Instinct again. He's too inexperienced with it and even though he was able to briefly tap into it consciously, he's not able to hold it too well and it doesn't seem very efficient. They need something else, and Trunks has the perfect idea. After seeing what Tien and Yamcha did, he asked Goku and Vegeta if they can fuse. They bring up that Gohan and Goten said they shouldn't because that means one less fighter, but Trunks reminds them that there's advantages to it. They have pretty much no other options, so if they have one less fighter, that doesn't really matter. And if they were to fuse and go into Super Saiyan Blue at full power, they might be able to catch Jiren off guard and knock him out. The two consider this, and it seems pretty risky, so they think hard about what to do. Gohan and Goten are about to be knocked out by Jiren, and Jiren's about to show off his full power. The twins are beaten up pretty badly, and it seems that they're not going to come back from this. And as Jiren's about to knock them out, a massive blue blur hits him from behind, knocking the wind out of him. It catches Jiren off guard, and sends him flying off the ring because of the sheer power of it. If only he went full power earlier on, he would have been able to prevent this, but he's been holding back this whole time, getting too cocky. After he's knocked out of the ring, it's revealed who did it. Standing there, in a brilliant blue aura, is Gogeta, who reaches out his hands and lifts up Gohan and Goten. They're surprised to see him here, and Gogeta apologizes because he knows they didn't want him to fuse. But they point at Jiren in the stands and tell him that it worked out in the end. They thank Trunks too because even though it was risky, it was a really smart move to do that as a last resort. Gohan and Goten guess they were wrong about fusion, because that's actually what helped them out a lot here. First with Tiencha and then Gogeta. Had they not fused and gone full power, Jiren would have gone full power eventually and won against everyone, so it's good that Goku and Vegeta fused early on and knocked Jiren out before he could power up any further. So they have a few people left in the ring. Who's the MVP? Gogeta who got the final blow, Gohan and Goten who were doing very well in the tournament, or Trunks? And I'd honestly say the MVP is Trunks. His idea ended up saving the universe, and he had a multitude of eliminations throughout the tournament. Plus, he even gave out some of his own power so Goku could heal up, making sure Gogeta would be a more effective fusion. With his smart thinking, good performance, and selfless acts, Trunks seems to be a good candidate for MVP. He's well aware of what his best friends Gohan and Goten probably want for a wish, and he knows that it's the right thing to do, so his wish is to restore every other universe. Zeno was pleased, and this is exactly what he wanted and everyone is brought back to existence, creating a happy ending. Universe 7's fighters return home, happy to be victorious and that everything went so well. So what now? Well, there's not going to be any Broly movie because there's no Frieza around. Potentially something could happen in the future, but I don't see it as being likely that Broly is going to get off planet Vampa. And as for Moro, I want to wait until the manga finishes that arc. Kind of like I mentioned in the beginning of the video. I know I already covered it in another scenario, but for this what if I'm going to wait on it, and possibly continue once that arc's over. And with all of that done, that means, at least for now, this is the finale for the series. So what did you guys think about this part, and what do you think will happen if we continue it? What did you guys think about the series overall? Leave your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below, and I'll be sure to check them out so I can see what you guys think. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like, and let's try to hit our like goal of 3000 likes, and if you haven't already, why not subscribe? as well as hitting the bell icon to get notified about any future videos I upload to my channel, including continuations to the scenario. Thank you all for watching, thank you all for supporting this what if, and I'll see you all in my next video.